Good afternoon, everyone. It is now two o'clock, and welcome, everybody. We've got rather a lot of uh, general public here today at our meeting. Um, so please be uh, advised that all mobile phones must be switched off while you're in the chamber, as we are also live streaming. Seems though the members never, ever get abreast of um, turning off their mobile phones. Right. Introductions first, then. I'm County Councillor Ruth Edwards and Chair of the Planning Committee, and to my right... Uh, County Councillor Peter Clark, and I'm the Vice Chairman. And uh, I'm uh, Robert Tranter, uh, Solicitor and the Monitoring Officer of Monmouthshire County Council. Mark Hand, Head of Planning, Housing and Place Shaping. Paula Clark, Development Management Area Manager. Uh, Richard Williams, Democratic Services. Craig O'Connor, Development Management Area Manager. Sarah Jones, Principal Planning Policy Officer. Thank you very much. Members of the committee, don't all take introductions now, but as and when they're asked to speak, I issue their names so you all know then who is speaking. Can everyone at the back hear perfectly okay? Right, thank you. I think they've improved the microphones a little bit better now. Apologies for absence, please. Uh, just one apology from Councillor Webb, Chair. Right, thank you very much. There is one... Um, uh, councillor that isn't present. I don't know whether he will come in later, but we haven't received his apologies. Declarations of interest, please. N none whatsoever by the look of it. Right, thank you. We'll now go on to the minutes of the last meeting. The planning meeting was held on the uh, 5th of November. Page 1, page 2, page 3, Page four, page five, page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, page ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, page fifteen. Page 16 and page 17. I'm sorry, I believe I said the 5th of November. Um, so, no, it was the 5th of September. So, does somebody wish to move? move. Councillor David Evans moves approval. Do you have a seconder, Councillor? Councillor Harris, could I have a show of hands for approval, please? Charles, did you wish to speak? Sorry, is yeah, there a just, just briefly, Chairman, to, to thank the case officer for the Clive the Motors application we uh, discussed last time and uh, to report that a meeting was held with the applicant and agent and a revised design was produced, which was, was far superior and I understand that's going to go to delegated panel. So just to thank the members of the committee and the officers. Thank you very much, Councillor Howard, for that. Right, we now move on to consider the applications of today. And the first one... Uh, Who's that? Uh, Mark, if you'd like to introduce that, please. This is on page 19 to 38, uh, 01360 in Abu Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. This is uh, a full application for residential development, um, a site called Derry Farm on the northern outskirts of Abu um, so the area of Abu known as Mardi. It's this area outlined in uh, or shaded in. Uh, a kind of a brownie colour on this plan. Um, so it's full application for 250 dwellings. It's an allocated LDP site under policy SAH1, um, and the allocation is for approximately 250 dwellings. So it's it's in accordance with that, and the principle of development there is set. The applications for a mix of one, two, three, and four bedroom homes, and it includes 49 affordable housing units. Um, so that's 19.6%, just shy of 20%. Uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, it also includes the undergrounding of four, four pylons, um, two within the site and two just outside, um, and the erection of a new pylon um, just to the east of the area of land, shaded brown on that plan, um, to facilitate that undergrounding. Again, I'll go through more detail in a minute. Um, in terms of the context of the site, Chair, it's um, northern edge of Abergavenny, as I mentioned. It's adjacent to the Brecon Beacons National Park, which is immediately to the north, um, and also on the hills around towards the northeast. 
uh, there's two listed buildings in the immediate vicinity of the site. Um, so we have a duty to look at the setting and the architectural and historic importance of those buildings. Um, they are the, the local church, St Tylo's, and also uh, a property that we looked at on site yesterday, just off the lane. I'll just indicate roughly where they are now. The uh, property on the lanes around here and the church is within this area. So we just have to bear in mind uh, the legal duties associated with listed buildings that are set out in the report and that I just mentioned. Uh, to provide a bit of context, um, some photos of the site, as we would have seen yesterday. So access to the site would be from the centre, um, roughly, of the Hereford Road frontage. There'd be a single point of access. Um, and there's two existing properties, um, more or less opposite, um, numbers one and two. Uh, one of which um, fronts on to Hereford Road and the other one's um, pretty much sideways on but does have some windows in the end elevation. Um, from further up the lane that I mentioned, looking into the site, um, this photo is really fuzzy on there, unfortunately, but there's an existing track which would be uh, retained as pedestrian um, access, but no vehicular access. And you can just about see along the line of that track, um, partly hidden by the tree is one of the pylons that would be removed. And beyond that is existing uh, development on Poplar's Close. Uh, this is from the uh, eastern end of the lane looking into the site. So in the centre of that photo, the two uh, cottages on Hereford Road um, that we showed in the first photo. Um, so this area in the foreground there is part of the development site. And this is uh, swivelling slightly around to the right. So those cottages are on the left of that photo now. And there's another one of the, the, uh, the pylons that will be removed. And then swivelling around a bit more. Um, there's an existing bungalow there um, which will be retained um, so I'll point that out on the plans as we proceed and that's uh, the same as the first photo but with the grass cuts so in terms of the details of the application um, the vehicle access as I mentioned is off Hereford Road in this location and those are the cottages I referred to. So single access in, um, we did look with highways at the opportunities for other access points, um, but that wasn't possible due to highway safety issues. Um, we also looked at the potential for a bus route to go uh, through the site and out the other end towards the school, um, which the applicants are willing to do, but that wasn't feasible in highway safety terms. So there are pedestrian linkages through, um, but that vehicular access um, is the one serving the site. There'll be visibility displays provided, um, and we've had a late plan in, um, which isn't on the presentation, but was on the boards outside, um, showing the gradient of that, because we had a discussion on site yesterday about vehicles coming and, coming and going, and, uh, uh, and light shining into the cottages opposite. So as we discussed um, yesterday on site, you can see the access road has a slight kink in it, which sought to um, minimize uh, that light glare as much as possible. And also on the gradient plan, you'll see um, it isn't the current land levels. The road will be much lower down, um, which will also help uh, reduce that light glare. Um, but that is the optimum position for the access in terms of highway safety. Um, carrying on with highway safety, um, there's no highways objections, as I mentioned, subject to various works, which will be covered by Section 278 Highways Agreement. Um, but in particular will be um, the extension of the 30 mile an hour speed limit, which is a, a key issue that's come through on the consultation um, and from Councillor Lane. So that will be moved up um, north on Hereford Road um, to seek to ensure the vehicles reduced to 30 well before they get to that junction. Um, so that's uh, that side of proposals. I mentioned the bus. Um, there's a Section 106 contribution towards uh, the bus being pump primed to enter into the site and go around in that loop um, and come back out. Um, and also the pedestrian connectivity is, is essential on this site. So there's another plan further on. Um, I'll show you showing those links. Um, so this is a green infrastructure plan which shows some of the phasing of developments. The first phase um, in the pinky purple colour towards me, 
then orange and the red bit up towards the north. So to get your bearings, it's Hereford Road on my side. The Brecon Beacons National Park boundary is right up uh, with the lane there. So those homes will be fronting straight onto the uh, National Park. Um, in terms of those access points, there's a pedestrian link proposed in the southwest corner, um, which will go through to the school and with links on uh, with an improved footpath links on to the uh, residential areas and on into town. Um, the northernmost corners um, links onto the lane and the existing public rights away network, um, which we encourage from a green infrastructure point of view. Um, and then towards the centre of the site, um, there's provision for a future link into uh, the uh, the residential properties to the south, so either by Poplars Close um, or uh, Greystones, preferably Greystones. The proposal is possibly not that clear from the plans on the screen, but the proposal includes a footpath along Hereford Road um, going south. Um, there's also provision in the junction right turn for um, a pedestrian refuge in the centre, um, but it's not desirable for that to be the main route through for pedestrians. And one of the key issues um, still being tackled is a, a gap in the footpath just off the bottom of this plan um, where it goes up the left-hand side of Hereford Road heading north um, then there's a slight gap and then the applicants will provide a new path in there. So there's a slight change to what's in the report before you in terms of those Section 106 contributions, just to clarify. Um, what we're seeking is for the applicants to design up um, and cost up provision of that footpath and then seek to acquire any land that's required to put that path in place. Um, should that not happen, then it could revert to the council to exercise compulsory purchase powers um, or we could look at other options, uh, but that is the preferred preferred course. And there's other Section 106 contributions I mentioned for the bus and for those other pedestrian links. Um, in terms of other key issues, we've got the green infrastructure plan on here, um, which also shows the landscape in. So there's uh, existing hedge along the frontage of the site, um, will be retained where possible, but there'll be parts of it which were within the um, visibility display. Um, so they'll be uh, removed and uh, new planting put in. You can see there's a, uh, a decent green buffer along the frontage of the site on Hereford Road, uh, and also along the north of the site by the National Park, as well as a really extensive green corridor through the site, which provides a great green infrastructure asset um, for future residents. Um, its current location is primarily dictated by where the pylons will be undergrounded. So there's a stretch of land on top, um, which has to be kept free from built development. Towards the centre, you can see some green circles. That's where there'll be a, a community orchard proposed, um, which the developers agreed to. So rather than providing a more traditional forms of adult recreation, including things like allotments, um, doing something along those lines, um, which a green infrastructure team has requested. And there's a, a local area of play in the centre of the site. Um, next to that but in terms of that we're focusing on and the developers happy to do a more naturally based um, informal play space um, than the springy chickens that we uh, frequently talk about um, so it's a, a a really good scheme in that sense from the green infrastructure proposals there's also uh, an element of tree planting along the main streets um, to green it up we've been really mindful of where the key frontages are onto those green spaces um, both for natural surveillance and urban design point of view um, and the applicants worked with us on uh, on that basis. Um, ecology, trees, and landscape matters. They're all covered in the report, um, but they're they're all resolved to our satisfaction, and the relevant officers are are happy. And um, there's been extensive negotiations um, dealing with this application. You'll have seen its application number says it came in in 2014. Um, so two key areas really. The first one was around um, the pylons, and that's one of the main reasons it's been with us for quite a while. Um, the cost of the pylons um, is in the millions and we've gone through um, all those works required, Western Powers involved uh, and the bottom line is uh, the viability of the scheme is affected. So a significant proportion of that cost has come off the land value and the landowners having to take that hit um, but we do have to factor in part of it as an abnormal cost in development. So we've gone to the district valuation service to have this independently corroborated um, and they've come back um, saying that the site can achieve the section 106 contributions we've detailed 
and the 49 affordable units, which are the mix that surely our housing officer wants. Um, and the applicants have agreed to that. That is significantly more affordable housing than was initially on the table. So we accept this below our policy of 35%, but our policy does say we have to look at viability um, where there's evidence that is a problem and that has been properly and robustly checked but independently by the DV. So we have got the 49 um, affordable units. The mix of those is set out in paragraph 5.9.3 of the agenda. But there's um, 16 one-bedroom walk-up flats, three two-bedroom bungalows, 21 two-bedroom homes, um, seven three-bedroom homes, and two four-bedroom homes. So that, um, that achieves the housing mix that Shirley's seeking. And they meet the uh, design quality standards. Uh, we're working with Mellon to ensure that. Just covering off um, on the pylons, so as I mentioned, uh, you'll have seen from the site, there's very uh, significant infrastructure running through the site. Two pylons on the site, the two central red circles um, and the two to the west of the site are all to be removed and those cables undergrounded. Um, where there's two green circles, um, they are new towers. The left-hand one is a temporary tower just during construction and the right-hand one is a new pylon, um, which is part of this application. And then on the far right is a blue tower, um, blue pylon, which remains. So everything uh, west of the, uh, the green circle closest to me is undergrounded. What was originally hoped is that the, uh, the whole thing could be undergrounded from the blue pylon, um, but that involves going underneath the, um, the trunk <laughs> roads, the railway and the river, um, which just hasn't been feasible. So there's a new pylon proposed on that right-hand green circle, um, after which the pylons are undergrounded. Um, so from Hereford Road onwards, um, all of that plot on the landscape is removed. So there is a bit of visual impact from the new pylon, but we're satisfied on the balance. It significantly outweighs um, the current situation. So to give you an example, um, the existing towers are on the left. They're in the region of 45 to 49 metres in height. Um, the new pylon that's needed is this central one, option one. So it is a much shorter um, shorter pylon. And there's been a separate consultation exercise on that. We've heard concerns from residents um, about the views of that. Um, but on balance, we're satisfied that's far better than the existing situation. Um, and uh, we think we're supportive of that. In terms of the house types, this is the other area of negotiation. We've had considerable negotiation over um, the applicants have gone from their standard design to add in uh, the recessed windows, the detail in, um, changes to the materials, um, chimneys to key plots, um, the headers and the sills and the overhanging eaves. Um, and again, on key plots, there's a plan outside. Um, the headers and sills um, and the windows will be on the side and the rear elevations where, where they're visible from public vantage points. There's about 49 properties uh, where that's the case. So some extra house types, as I said, um, detached, semi-detached, and terraced. Um, I'll go back to the site layout in a minute to show you the uh, where the mix of materials is based. This is actually the landscaping plan, um, but towards the northern section of the site is predominantly render and stone finish, um, and also along the frontage of Hereford, Hereford Road. Um, towards the, uh, the western corner, closest to... Uh, poplars close, uh, predominantly brick, um, which is in keeping with what's in that area. And you'll see as well the development's more dense in those areas. So we believe there's benefits from the pylon removal. We've also been mindful in terms of residential amenity uh, with privacy distances. So the homes you can see backing onto poplars close, um, they're in the region of 26 metres away. So that exceeds our 21 metre window to window relationship. Um, there's one or two of those properties are what we call two and a half stories. So they have three stories of living accommodation um, and they're further away from the boundary. So again, we're happy with that amenity distance. So Chair, they're the key points. Um, if I just recap on the Section 106 agreements, contributions, um, there's the affordable housing that I mentioned. Um, there's a £10,000 contribution towards um, habitat creation, um, £40,000 towards the bus infrastructure, um, around about £40,000 towards the highways links, um, but with the change I mentioned on the Hereford Road footpath. There's £110,000 for Welsh Medium Primary Education, 
um, there's sufficient capacity in English language primary and secondary. Um, and that figure, the 110, is based on the proportion from education departments experience, a proportion of children that would go to the Welsh Medium School. Um, there's £120,000 towards upgrading the Mardi uh, play area. And then we've got the on-site lap and the community orchards. So, Chair, um, those uh, points cover the main issues for the development. As I mentioned, it's in accordance with the LDP. It's an allocated site, um, and we recommend that it's approved subject to conditions with the amendments in the late correspondence um, and subject to the Section 106 agreement. Thanks. Thank you for that, Mark. Now you've got the plan up there. I'm sure a lot of people here would like you to identify exactly where the affordable housing is on the plan. I haven't got the one on the screen with them on, um, but it's pepper potted through the site. Uh, so if I just stand up and point to the main clusters. Um, this, this bungalow here, I should have pointed out this bungalow here is affordable, um, but that bungalow is next to the existing bungalow I mentioned. Um, there's affordable in this area uh, and down here, uh, and then a cluster in this area here. Um, there's yeah, there's, there's none or, or much less in that northern part. So it's primarily in this area and this area here. There's a couple um, pepper potted in as well. Right, thank you for that, Mark. I believe the local member wishes to uh, speak to the committee on this. Thank you, Councillor Lane. You have six minutes and later on you can have two minutes to sum up if you so wish. Thank you. Thank you. Malcolm Lane, County Council for the Mardi, with Lentili Patholi, Hunter Gethley, Lenjui Skirid, and indeed um, Brenna Gwenin. I thank the um, planning officer for his presentation this afternoon, indeed highlighting um, all the attributes and, in my opinion, the not so much attributes of this uh, application. My concern primarily, of course, is the um, access to the whole site, indeed, on what I would describe as a very, very sharp bend in the road, indeed, and the access coming out exactly opposite uh, a double dwelling, uh, and indeed, and that would cause much discomfort to the people living there, I have to say. Um, there's been a long issue with traffic in this particular area, and indeed, um, I've taken issue over the volume of traffic as it stands indeed the amount of um, heavy vehicles traveling down making a shortcut from the main hereford road to the a40 but that's another matter but it affects the uh, the route anyway generally um, the access to this site uh, if you know the site as well, well as i do and i must say that i i, I as I, if i was sit, uh, sitting on this committee i would have to declare interest because I live within a quarter of a mile from it. And already the traffic uh, comes down this particular road around about 60 and sometimes more than that, up to 70 miles an hour. And by the time it hits the 30 mile an hour limit, it's well into that area. And in an area of the Mardi, which is already congested with traffic indeed. What concerns me is the volume of traffic coming out of this new development 250 houses, I, I admit that the traffic is not going to uh, arrive on the main road at the same time, but it's going to be a continual volume of traffic coming onto a very busy road, a well-used road at the moment, and that's going to cause a lot of problems for local residents as they travel down through the, the, the Mardi towards Abergavenny itself. Um, this particular site was identified, I believe, late into the LDP uh, as, an, uh, as an addition, and of course um, that has been noted. The objections as they stand have been well documented by the local action group against this development, indeed, and many, many good points have been already highlighted. I would say, in my opinion, one of the carrots, I suppose, is removing the pylons and um, putting the cables underground. Um, but of course, that's come at a cost. We all we know that. Re the reduction in the affordable housing from around 35% to 19.6% indeed. 
I'd like to know really if the developers are going to say, well, when are they going to drop the pylons? Are they going to do it in the start or are they going to complete some of the houses first in that case? And if they're going to do that, would there be an undertaking that they will continue to, to, do, to do what they've undertaken to do? That's one concern I have. Um, the other point I'd like to raise really is that... Um, with this development, the um, extra demand of the services in Abergavenny, um, has that been sort of thought about extensively or not? You know, I'm thinking more about uh, the general service, hospitals, doctor surgeries. You know, you have 250 dwellings with families in each dwelling. Uh, is that going to put... Uh, an extra demand on services which are already at stretch, I believe, in Abergavenny. But these are the, some of the items which I have liked to bring to this uh, uh, planning committee. There'll be other speakers after me, which I know will probably, who have been involved with the action committee, who will outline other, other concerns they have. But mine primarily here is, that, is, is the reduction in affordable housing and um, also the traffic element, and I believe that is uh, a very substantial uh, uh, problem indeed. So that's what I'd like to say at this stage. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Lane. I believe we have a, a speaker who's an objector. If you'd like to take a stand, please, and you have four minutes. Please state your name at the start. Thank you. Uh, Simon Griffiths, a uh, local resident in the Mardi area. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak this afternoon um, and to explain opposition to the dairy farm development. Many people have consistently opposed this de development since it first emerged as the council's preferred strategic housing site. The key reasons for this objection have been um, the impact on traffic volumes along the Hereford Road, particularly through Mardi and its junction with Park Road, the failure of the development to comply with the sustainability policies of the Council and the Welsh Government, the dramatic impact on the landscape and the negative effects on wildlife, the dangerous location of the site access, the failure of the proposal to meet the Council's own requirement in respect of 35% of homes to be affordable, with only 19.6% now being proposed, and the unacceptable siting of a new pylon along the Hereford Road. These issues are dealt with in detail uh, in the objection made by Mardi Against Dairy Development Group, which is on the Council's website. In the, in the limited time I have available, I'd like to focus on a few key points. First, the planning inspector stated uh, in accepting inclusion of dairy farm in the LDP that she was relying on the Council to live up to the promises on traffic reduction measures. There is little or no evidence of this being done. Secondly, the Council and the developers have in the past argued that the scheme would be viable and that affordable housing targets would therefore be met. Objectors have consistently argued that this would not be the case and that as soon as the scheme found its way onto the LDP, the developers would backtrack on commitments. This has proven to be the case. This is a critical point as the Council has always held that more affordable homes is a crucial objective. In logic, the scheme can only be considered truly viable if it meets all of the prescribed requirements. Thirdly, the planners argued throughout the LDP process that the negative aspects of the development were unavoidable, as Dairy Farm was, quote, the least worst option, and on this basis rejected all alternative sites. Since then, at least two of those alternative sites have been given planning permission. This, coupled with the failure to deliver on promises, indicates that the so-called least worst option is no longer unavoidable. The impact on traffic and safety, the impact on the landscape adjacent to the National Park, the lack of sustainability and all of the other negative aspect, uh, impacts of the development are not offset by the gains which are now being significantly reduced. Furthermore, other developments are now in the pipeline which were not when the LDP was being prepared. Over the years, a great deal of evidence has been provided by objectors to the development. At every stage of the process, the Council's planners have rejected their arguments on the grounds of the greater good, offsetting all of the negative factors. 
it's now clear that the greater good has been significantly reduced and the lack of alternatives has been shown to be incorrect. It's fair to say that in the view of local people, the benefits have been overstated and there is widespread dismay at what has happened in relation to affordable homes. It's also wide, a widely held view that the downsides have been understated. There is great concern over traffic flows. The situation in Mardi is already bad. <coughs> traffic studies have understated commuting and overstated the likely use of public transport, walking and cycling. Uh, the committee should reject the application. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Griffiths. I believe we have someone now wishing to speak on behalf of the developer. Please state your name and you have four minutes also. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Hotchkiss, Persimmon Homes. Thank you, uh, Chairman and Committee. As you know, the site at Derry Farm um, was allocated in the adopted LDP and therefore the principle of development has previously been established. The principles of sustainability and suitability have already therefore firm. Representations made throughout the, the LDP process stated the site would be viable subject to the section 106 and the detailed viability to be undertaken in due course. Persimmon now proposes a scheme of 250 homes ranging in size from between one and four bedrooms. Of these 250 homes, 400, 449 homes are proposed uh, to be affordable, of which three will be bungalows, which I understand from the affordable housing officer are a specific need, uh, specific local need, and um, are required on this site. The scheme also involves the removal and undergrounding of four pylons, two of which are located on the site and two adjacent on adjacent land. The total cable length of undergrounding is about three quarters of a mile or 1.2 kilometers. The existing pylons on the site that will be removed are between 46 and 49 meters in height. We've been advised that in order to transfer, transverse the railway line, the River Gaveni, and overcome, overcome the topography, a single new terminal tower, a height of 29 meters, so significant, significantly below the existing pylons to be removed, excuse me, uh, will be will be installed. This will be positioned east of Hereford Road, down the slope next to the River Gaveni. This location and of course the height of 29 metres, which is significantly below the height of existing pylons on the site, will lessen its impact further. The removal of the pylons will clearly bring significant positive impacts to residents of Greystones Crescent, the wider setting of Abergavenny and also the National Park. It should be noted that Brecon Beacons National Park have also supported the removal of the pylons. The new junction at the site entrance with right turn lane has been assessed by our planning consultants and transport consultants and indeed has been assessed by the uh, Council Highways officers. A series of footpaths are created through the site and adjacent to, to the wider area with linkages to the town centre and the details of which are being finalised with officers. Overall, the scheme is considered to be well designed, has a materials palette that reflects the, uh, the site's locality. Existing trees and hedgerows across the site are retained and protected within significant areas of open space. Uh, and we also include a children's play area with community orchard in the central part of the site. Buffer planting is also proposed around the site boundaries, particularly to the northern areas towards the National Park and to the eastern side nearest to St Tylo's house and church which are listed. Over the past three to four years, we've worked closely with officers to make a series of refinements to the proposals. These include a series of design and elevational enhancements to the scheme, over and above our standard specification to meet officer requirements. These have included overhanging eaves and window reveals, utilizing our village house type range as opposed to our more urban house type range, and that has involved additional glazing bars, stone heads and sills above windows and porches. In addition, we've upgraded the materials palette to use um, slate effect roof tiles, re reconstituted stone and render, particularly again on the northern and eastern elevations. Stone heads and sills and glazing bars are also proposed on the prominent, prominent rear elevations of properties. Additional windows following consultation with officers have also been added to rear, sorry, have also been added to side and gable elevations of properties to increase surveillance of the public realm. In addition, following comments from the highways officer, the 30 mile an hour uh, 
The speed limit has been moved northwards along Hereford Road to just beyond the existing access with St Tylo's uh, Church. And also, we've amended the scheme to provide a footpath a path link to the school and have safeguarded a route to Grace. Could you please presence. wind up your uh, presentation, please? You're running out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're providing a series of Section 106 uh, contributions. Uh, at the present time, Monmouth Shears land supply is presently below five years, and therefore there is a, a critical need for strategic allocated sites to be approved. Approval of Dairy Farm will assist the Council in defending speculative applications elsewhere. We therefore respectfully request that members approve the application in accordance with officers' recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Hodgkiss. I believe um, Mark will give some clarity on a few things that uh, has has arisen now through those presentations. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Chairs. Just a couple of points that came up there um, that perhaps weren't covered um, initially. Um, in terms of the traffic, um, there's a, a traffic assessment coming as part of the application, um, which I think Mr Griffiths alluded to. Um, but that has been looked at um, by our highways officers. Um, they take a very traditional view of the, uh, the modal split, as we call it. So developers are quite often... Um, work on quite a generous case scenario with lots of people using the bus or cycling and not many people driving but our highways team uses very traditional um, modal splits and so would have looked at um, a more realistic um, slash slightly pessimistic arguably um, vehicle generation so they are happy um, with that side of things they've looked at the vehicle speeds and the traffic volumes um, in terms of affordable housing I mentioned that and explained the viability but it is worth mentioning that since the LDP examination, the pile on undergrounding costs have, um, I think I'm right in saying, nearly doubled um, from Western Power. So there's been a very significant increase there, um, which is uh, why some of those negotiations were required. Um, but as I said, we have gone to the DV for that to be looked at independently. Um, and Persimmons also submitted their actual bill costs, so rather than going on some kind of theoretical regional patterns, um, we know the, the real information. Um, the third point I was going to mention really briefly um, was around demand on services. So at LDP allocation stage, um, the health board was engaged with um, and uh, were satisfied with what was coming forward in terms of housing numbers. So there has been no request from them for additional infrastructure. Um, and that's the basis on uh, which we've had to approach it. We've had separate discussions about what we do with them um, going forward for new sites and uh, the next LDP. Um, but that's where we are with this one. Um, and then finally, um, a query was raised by Councillor Lane about pylon removal. Um, so to clarify the time scales, the set, these will be tied down in a Section 106 um, agreement to make sure um, it's adhered to. Uh, because of their very significant lead-in time with various parts of the contract, uh, we're proposing that um, developers be allowed to do the road infrastructure at the front of the site um, and up to 50 foundations, um, after which they'll have to demonstrate they've entered into the contract of Western Power. They couldn't go beyond that. Um, and then before the occupation of the 75th dwelling, all of the pylons would have to be removed. Um, to give you an idea of the context, 75 dwellings is, is just shy of what's in the first um, phase closest to me. Um, so that gives round about sort of a, an 18 month window um, in terms of construction, after which they'd be gone. So legally, they wouldn't be able to carry on um, beyond either of those two uh, two benchmarks. So you can you can imagine in terms of putting in foundations and the roads, there's a huge infrastructure cost there, um, which in itself is an incentive to uh, to crack on and do the rest of the uh, the promises. Um, but there are those those safeguards in there for us. Thank you very much for that detailed explanation, Mark. I now open it out to the committee for comments. Um, I will first actually, I know Councillor uh, Murphy's put his hand up, but I will take the Abergavenny members first, please, because it's more in their vicinity. Uh, Councillor Harris first, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, it's, uh, my ward is next door to the, uh, uh, to the uh, site. Uh, we've had a very uh, comprehensive um, uh, outline of, uh, of, of pros and cons from Mark. Uh, objectors, um, Councillor Lane, and uh, the uh, developer, and most of the uh, areas of, in fact, probably all of the areas of uh, 
contention have been uh, covered, we must remember that it's a, a strategic uh, allocated site within the local uh, development uh, plan and uh, if we uh, get to uh, turn it down, I'm not quite sure what the consequences uh, will be, but that's up to the uh, uh, committee. It's important to remember that um, when the local development plan was being considered, the inspector wrapped this uh, council on the knuckles because we had vastly uh, underplayed, if you like, the number of uh, uh, housing units that we had got in the um, LDP and we were forced, I think, I believe, to uh, put an additional um, 800 in at the... Um, hmm? 900, yes, okay, hundreds. So, you know, we're, we're, we're vastly, uh, uh, we were vastly under the number. Um, uh, so we've got to be very careful um, uh, when we're considering strategic allo allocation sites uh, like this to, uh, to actually, um, uh, to, to get it right. If we look at the uh, statutory uh, consultees, uh, I've never seen such a positive list uh, in, uh, in many a long year on the, uh, on the council, in, in, including the um, community council. Their main concern was uh, it would be far better if there was more than one uh, access, but uh, as we can see, that, uh, uh, that isn't uh, possible. We hear constantly um, about problems with uh, traffic uh, and if we listen to all the uh, uh, objections on the, the fact there's going to be an increase in, uh, in, in traffic, we'd never build anything anywhere ever. Uh, we just got to live with uh, the fact that if we build 250 houses, there's going to be an increase in traffic. Um, uh, just as a digression, the other day at quarter past seven in the morning, I was attempting to get from one side of Hereford to the other. Um, this is a quarter past seven in the morning. It took me practically half an hour to uh, to clear Hereford. We don't know what uh, uh, traffic problems are in uh, Abergavenny yet. Uh, uh, if we uh, again come back to the um, uh, development, if we could see the GI, um, uh, that that that's that's absolutely. Lovely. If if you look at that uh, GI outline on that plan, and you look down below it, and you see grey stones and uh, and poplars close, etc. Where would you rather be, uh, um, you know, if you're going to be on a development like this or on, or on the older ones down, uh, down below? This has got lovely open space, uh, a lot more open space. I know some of it is due to uh, uh, the undergrounding, but that's a positive, uh, uh, positive advantage there, I, 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 I think. I think it's a well laid out um, uh, site. It's also had the um, influence of um, uh, officers interacting with the developers, the delegated panel uh, interacting with the uh, uh, developers, and I believe even probably the uh, the civic society in uh, in Abergavenny. So, whilst um, it's it, 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 we have attempted to improve as much as we can within uh, basically negotiations with the uh, developers. So I think that site uh, is as, 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 as good as we can see practically um, anywhere. Uh, what else have we got here? Yes, the, the, as mentioned in the report, there are some field boundaries actually um, on the fields of there, uh, uh, as it is at the moment, and they're going to be uh, uh, retained. And we don't often see that uh, in the middle of um, a, a development. Uh, it's been stated that the um, in the report that the um, uh, 
the highway system can accommodate um, uh, the uh, the increase in traffic and obviously there is going to be an increase and there will be uh, um, a slower movement of traffic further down uh, into the town but that's inevitable if we've got 250 new houses it's also been uh, mentioned um, that unfortunately we haven't got the 35% affordable houses that are in our supplementary planning guidance which again uh, is, is is guidance and it's been mentioned why uh, totally uh, um, uh, outstanding abnormals in this uh, development including vast amount of money to uh, underground the uh, the cables and I'm the first one to admit we can't have enough affordable uh, houses but that's the way it's panned out in uh, this particular development uh, there are there's much more but I, I, I could say, but I think the important thing is um, we, we've got an increase in the 30 mile an hour limit. And what I would plead with the uh, uh, developers one way or another is if we can have permanent flashing 30 mile an hour signs at, at um, convenient sites either, either side of the uh, uh, development just to remind us all um, that it is a 30 mile an hour uh, zone if that could be arranged I would be uh, extremely grateful anyway I'm going to let other people uh, have a say now but if nobody uh, in the end comes up with uh, uh, being a proposer I'll be happy to uh, propose this thank you Madam Chair Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Harrison. As you said, there's a lot of talk about um, the use of the car, but there's quite a contribution to uh, for a bus service and, and walkways, which is also beneficial if that comes to fruition in this particular site. Councillor Murphy, I believe you wish to speak. Oh, sorry, Councillor Maureen, if you want to then, please. Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Harris has said actually most of what I wanted to say anyway, so I agree with everything he says. Um, the fact that we've got to put the pylons underground has an added uh, attribute, the fact that the school, just up on that side, there's a pylon very close to it, and I was always very worried about that, and that is one of the ones that's coming down. So it, there's a lot of things to benefit from this. I know it's worrying when you get the extra traffic, but um, there's the other thing with being extra traffic, they may have to go slower, and you won't have those people that can dive through the quieter space at about 70 miles an hour, regardless of the speed limit or the police. So in one way, that does slow things down. I just hope they go far enough back with their 30 mile an hour. And I think the flashing signs are the best things because people subconsciously slow down when they flash. And I think that they're the best form. And uh, it, I, the look of it, it does look so far better, the space houses than the ones down below here in Poplar's Close and Greystone. So I think it would be a very good development. I sympathise with the people living locally because we never want change. We never want an awful lot of other people coming there to live. But people have got to have homes and they've got to come to live. And uh, I would second it. Thank you, Councillor Powell. Councillor Murphy now. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And um, yeah, uh, obviously a lot of the points I was going to bring up have been covered, so I won't do it again. Um, the, uh, when the LDP was, uh, was put together, uh, there were criteria which are quite different from what we are, are dealing with uh, today. And we are dealing with today, not what we did five or six years ago. Uh, so yes, we, we are looking at things uh, uh, d differently. Um, I'm pleased that the smaller the house types has been taken out, and I'm pleased by the uh, additional features that have been uh, put in. I would like to see a few more chimneys dotted around, particularly on the larger houses, uh, and whether or not um, the developer can, can look at these plans from that point of view. Uh, I don't know, but I would be grateful if he did. Can I turn my attention, though, to picking up on this 30 mile an hour zone? Um, I know it's going further north. Um, Mark, is it possible to see on that map how far it's, it's uh, going to, to uh, go? Uh, uh, the gentleman from Persimmon said by St Tylo's Church, but it strikes me that if that's the case, it's 
it, to my mind, far too close to the, the junction to, to have any benefit. So uh, have I got that wrong, or can we look at it being further up the Hereford Road? Chair, this will be something that will be covered by the Section 278. Um, so I did have a quick chat with Mark Davis before the meeting. Um, the legal minimum, uh, he's explained to me, would have to be the extent of the visibility display um, for the 30 mile an hour zone, but that doesn't come up very far. Um, Mark was uh, in the process of being persuaded that it should be north of the junction with the lane um, to uh, to get it beyond that, that junction there as well. I. I do know the council lane said to me one of the current challenges is um, people get to the current limit and then start breaking rather than do 30 by the time they're at the sign. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Mark's been made aware of that and we need to factor that in. So the further north we can push it to get the traffic speeds down, um, the better. But that the exact detail would be with him. Um, but that's a conversation I had with him for the meeting. Okay, well, on the basis of, uh, of uh, that, yeah, I think it would be a lot better if it was by the, uh, the, the lane. And Councillor Harris's uh, suggestion about the uh, repeater signs is obviously welcome. Um, as the, the uh, site is going to be lowered at the point of the access route and visibility displays uh, uh, put in, um, it wouldn't take more than another hour or so with a with a, a suitable uh, machine to widen those visibility displays a bit more, mm -hmm. uh, and that would, on that type of bend, uh, make it considerably safer. I I would have thought. Uh, so I would ask that considerations given to to widening the uh, visibility uh, displays. Uh, it isn't going to take much. There's a big buffer there uh, between the road and the. Um, the uh, properties, uh, and particularly on the northern end, there's there's no footpath. I think the footpath is going to do the job on the southern end. But if it could go, if it could come back a bit to create more visibility on the northern end, uh, that would make me a lot a lot happier. Um, but I shall be uh, I, I shall be supporting the uh, approval. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Any Councillor Louise Brown. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think uh, on the site visit, one of the things was is obviously <clears throat> an improvement in terms of the um, pylons um, going underground, although I didn't realise that there were a couple of sort of mini pylons um, still, still left. Um, but having said that, I think it will improve um, the, the look of the area with the um, pylons being removed uh it's unfortunate about the affordable housing side but obviously with regard to the cost of the pylons this is obviously one of the factors involved um just looking at a bit more detail about the people who've been consulted on this um i appreciate that this application is um a 2016 application um but um uh i did notice that the ward councillor meant about uh, mentioned about uh, consulting the health board in relation to um, housing. Now, I do realise that when the LDP was developed that the health board was consulted, but the practical reality is is there are quite a number of sites, and once an application gets to a point where it comes to planning committee, it's getting a, a, you know, a nearer end date to when there might be a need for extra um, uh, uh, GP GPs or GP surgeries, you know, because they do work on a sort of a one per certain amount of population. And so I think this is relevant if a particular surgery is getting to a, a tipping point. And I think it is relevant and I would, I would like to see it in all applications. And it isn't a minor application. And I did notice in this um, planning committee that later on there was a a consultation on on a couple of the uh, supplementary guidance policies including um, ones which only involve a few dwellings and the health board response was we would like to be um, consulted with regard to development so that we can plan our health services and I read it first of all and I thought perhaps I'd written it but um, it was actually the health board that <coughs> did it in relation to what's actually been said in speed limits, um, I think it is important to have these uh, uh, VAS signs, and they are 
effective and I think that um, I think you need probably at least two along a stretch of road particularly when it's a, a new type of um, speed limit and I don't know whether that can be added as a as an extra condition in this or um, part of uh, the highways agreement the other thing that I, I was looking at was the uh, comment that was on page 24 um, where it says uh, 4.1.15 and it may mentions the education sum now it says um, the council to provide additional uh, capacity within the Welsh medium school serving Abergavenny via section 106 agreement I've previously experienced a, a situation where there was a section 106 agreement when I was a uh, councillor in another authority and we couldn't use it um, to help uh, uh, various uh, roads um, it was supposed to assist roads in the area because of the wording of it and I think on this one that you should actually change the wording to say to provide additional capacity within the Welsh medium school or local schools serving Abergavenny via a section 106 agreement and that allows some flexibility in relation to schooling so that's just a, a slight amendment it makes no difference whatsoever to the amount of the sum that's being asked for but it does provide a little bit of extra future flexibility for Abergavenny schools thank you thank you councillor brown do you wish to comment on that please mark um yeah chair a couple of points there in terms of the health board um just to reiterate what we'd agreed previously. So from now on, we're consulting health boards on uh, the major applications for housing. Um, we're consulting them on SPG um, uh, when it's coming forward, which is why they're consulted on this one. Um, and we'll engage with them uh, again as we start doing the new LDP um, in uh, in due course. Um, but yeah, this application actually came in 2014, not 2016. Um, this well and truly predates those discussions. So, so I go back to... Sorry to interrupt. I think at the top it gave the reference as 2016, isn't it? Uh, it shouldn't have. It's 2014. But either way, um, it's definitely 2014. Um, so that's how we we'll work going forwards with the um, the next LDP and future applications. Um, but for this, we're working on what the um, the health board said at the LDP time. So they were consulted on the whole tranche of sites coming forwards, um, all of those development proposals. Um, and Chair, you'll probably remember we've also agreed to go to the health board with our annual projections of which new housing sites are coming forward, um, how quickly and where, um, so that can help them inform their infrastructure needs as well. Um, in terms of the speed signs, that wouldn't be a condition on this. It would be covered by the Section 278 Highways Agreement. So I've made a note to pass that and the display comments from Councillor Murphy um, to our highways colleagues, um, and they can incorporate those. Um, and then the last one was, um, I've completely forgotten. Oh, the education contribution. Um, the the legal tests on this are that um, we have to be able to justify what we're asking for the money for, and it has to be necessary in, to make the scheme acceptable in planning terms. So with education, it's really quite clear cut. If there are surplus spaces, we can't ask for money. And if there's not enough, then we can. Um, English speaking primary education, um, there is capacity. And that looks at the situation now. They factor in live births, so they know who's going to appear in a classroom in four years' time. Um, and they also factor in all of the permissions that we're granting and all of the LDP sites. So there's a fairly scientific set of spreadsheets behind the scenes where our colleagues in education go through mapping out um, who's going to enter into the schooling system when. And we have a way of calculating roughly how many people come from a new housing estate. So my advice to you, Chair, would be um, that a, a request for English speaking primary education or other education um, wouldn't meet the legal tests um, because the evidence at the moment is there is capacity, so there's no need. And again, that's projected forwards. Uh, the Welsh medium primary, there isn't capacity, so it is justified. So that's my, my advice to you. Thank you very much for that detailed explanation again, Mark. Uh, anybody else? Oh, sorry, Councillor Blakeborough. Thanks, Chair. The light's not on, but can I be heard? Is it? <laughs> um, with this um, development, I'm, I'm very aware that there actually has been a high level of consultation, and I, I, I feel comfortable that um, planning has taken into account people's suggestions because it, it's been very fluid. Things have changed as it's moved along. I think Councillor Harris um, highlighted 
how how much more spacious it is um, and um, yeah compared to decisions that have been made in the past I think um, the layout is much better yeah it's very very disappointing uh, only 49 affordable housing on the positive note it is pepper potted throughout and we have had developments where um, affordable housing is just tucked away in a corner somewhere and that isn't happening there which is which is uh, really good um, one of my concerns, as everybody else has highlighted, is the volume of traffic. And, and although highways are saying um, they're not concerned about that, I think with 250 dwellings, um, you're looking at probably about 1,000 extra car movements a day. And that is going to have an impact. Um, um, and that, that, you know, that, that does concern me. I guess the positive is if they've got a bus service there and pathways. So one of my questions just about the bus service, uh, when you're looking at sustainability, they're, they're offering 40,000. Now, I don't know how long that's going to last. And um, obviously, <coughs> Monmouth is going to have to have something in place when that money runs out to keep it, to keep it going, um, for it to really make an impact in real terms to keep the cars off the road. Um, the other area um, I'm sort of looking at is um, thanks, gone dog. Um, lighting. That's a, a drum I keep banging in terms of um, protecting the night skies. Uh, it has here that there is going to be a lighting design strategy, and I'm always a little concerned that we don't get to see this lighting design strategy at this point. In fact, we never see it once we've passed this. Um, and I'm just sort of looking towards Mark because we've had these conversations that um, uh, uh, planning highways and um, the developers work together. And I'm really keen to keep the low lighting so that it's health and safety. And particularly with it being near Brecon's uh, beacons, we, we should try and have that low lighting throughout and not really have any of the sort of um, that highlighting that um, is um, has massive negative impacts really so very municipal um, so question around that and then uh, infrastructure we talk about infrastructure broadband um, are we doing anything in terms of um, letting BT open reach know about this development so that broadband can be incorporated within this with throughout the development Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Blake. Greg, and Mark? Yeah, thanks, Joe. There's a number of questions in there. Um, in terms of the buses, um, I couldn't tell you exactly how long that £40,000 lasts, but the bus already comes into the development to the south, um, so isn't isn't a huge distance away. Um, sorry, I don't think it comes into Greystones Crescent, but it's in the area just to the south, um, that part of the Mardi. Um, so colleagues were happy it wasn't a huge amount to make it go a bit further, but the intention is just to pump prime it, try and get the bus there up front. Um, it's one of those chicken and egg scenarios. If you wait for there to be enough homes and people using the bus to generate the service need, then everyone's got in the habit of using their car. Um, so it's trying to put it in place. Um, the money's to pump prime it when there aren't that many paying customers and hopefully get people into those habits. Um, I realise there's a million factors around people and why they do or don't use the bus. Um, largely be where they work and where the bus is going to and the, the convenience of the times, but there's only so much um, the developer can do um, or, a, or a bit of money can do. Um, so that's that's the uh, the bus side of things. Um, in terms of the lighting, uh, Councillor Blinker and I have had a few discussions around this um, uh, and yeah, part of it around the interest on lighting in terms of ecology um, primarily and less so human beings and neighbouring residents so we can certainly take that on board if committee wanted those details could come back to you or could go to design panel um but yeah we can certainly look at that it's trying to get the balance between the low level lighting and our usual adopted highway standards um but we can certainly have that conversation uh, and then last but not least broadband um this is a real challenge for us and we've been having discussions is there a way you can use section 106 to fund this but i've had to conclude that we can't um but we can make developers aware um, and uh, hope that they put in the pipework infrastructure ready for somebody else to lay a cable. You know, they're already laying the other utilities and it is essentially the fourth utility these days. Um, so we can look at it in that way. We can't make them, it's simply encouraging them. But in terms of making the providers aware, um, I mentioned in the context of the health board, the information we have about housing sites coming forward, um, 
So uh, when Councillor Blakeborough and I discussed it previously, we've agreed we can also make that information more readily available to the broadband providers um, so they can help plan their infrastructure as well. So it's just trying to get all those different things lining up as best as we can. Thank you very much, Mark. It's been a, a big bugbear of me living in the countryside. We don't have a lot of street lighting or anything like that, and we all seem to manage that falling over usually. But a lot of houses today uh, tend to have sensor lights and so on, and in a built-up area, there is lighting from houses and all that. I don't know why we've always stuck with these great big columns of very often orange light, and, and it is, it's like a light pollution then because of the big developments. Um, so I think uh, I would certainly support more lower lighting. Um, and there was something else that uh, Debbie mentioned. The broadband, yes, I think everybody expects to have good broadband connections today, wherever they choose to live or work or whatever. So uh, I think we could, with a new development, try and stress that those are what are expected in modern living today. Um, uh, Councillor Howard, I believe you wish to speak. Thank you. Uh, four questions, Mark. The, the first one, you referenced the GI scheme. Um, how can you ensure that there will be no erosion of that in the future by parts of the landscaped areas being incorporated within curtilage? Is there anything you can do other than wait for any applications to come in? Uh, second point, I'd be interested to know what the working hours are in the construction management plan. I think given the, the neighbouring uh, properties of the southern boundary, that's extremely relevant. Third point, um, notwithstanding the Section 278 agreement, is there any scope to provide a traffic calming scheme or to condition it? Um, don't necessarily mean humps and bumps because that tends to an an annoy people, annoys me too, when I'm thinking of build-outs, priority gateways and such, rather than just rely on the negotiation with, with, with highways, which I assume would come up with nothing other than a bit of red patching on the road and a 30 mile an hour sign. And, th and the last point, I'd, I'd like to know if there have been any discussions about the location of the sales suite. And the reason I, I raised that one is um, in my previous ward in, in Gilwern, where I live, uh, Persimmon, a.k.a. Charles Church, have carried out two developments, the most recent of which they cited, uh, cited a sales cabin adjacent to the main road without consent. They were advised by the area engineer not to stop the road uh, and offload the porter cabin. Uh, they drove off, came back an hour later when there was nobody there. By the time they received consent for it and caused traffic hazards parking on the highway, uh, rather, by the time the, the, they applied for the consent and it was refused, the show house was up so they got what they wanted. I'm keen to see that that doesn't happen here and somewhere on the periphery of the site, given the nature of the road, that isn't put up and cause all sorts of issues. Thank you for those points, Councillor Howard. Uh, do you wish to comment on that then, please, Mark? Um, yeah, I caught a couple of them as questions, and there was one I wasn't sure about. Um, in terms of the green infrastructure, um, future management, there's a management plan um, controlled by condition. Um, but if somebody starts extending their garden, um, that's you know a retrospective enforcement activity a matter. We can't we are we can't preempt that. Um, so they, yeah, there's not much more we can do than that. Um, there's a point made about the construction management plan. And I think about the hours because of residential amenity, but I wasn't sure if there was a question associated with that or just... What are they? Oh, what are the hours? Um, I don't know. I shall have a, a trusty colleague have a quick flick at the moment. Um, they might be covered in the condition word in. Um, traffic calming, Jay, if you don't mind me asking a question back, did you mean within the site, Council Howards, or off-site? No, outside of the, the, the site on, on, the, on the main road. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm not sure. That would only be via the Section 278. Um, and that would be the way of controlling that with highways. Within the site, I'll answer the question you didn't ask, um, there are uh, some build-outs with tree planting in, um, which will help within the site. On the actual main roads, I'd have to discuss that with Mark um, Davis in highways. Um, it'll be the challenge of balancing, um, you know, preventing speed in traffic with physical means, but um, as Councillor Lane alluded to, it is heavily used by HGVs, um, and it is one of our main... Uh, main A roads through the county, so it's trying to get those things balanced up. Uh, so that would be via the section 278. I'll make a note to myself to uh, raise that with Mark as well. Um, and then last but not least, the sales suite. Um, I very much imagine it will be in this location here. I 
And I say that because nine times out of ten, they're at the front of the site. You have at least two or three different house types and a double garage to use as a sales showroom. Um, so that's my guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we could uh, we could add some kind of condition just setting out how that's provided for um, with the parking. See, I think the concern was primarily around visitor parking for future purchases um, being put in place and they don't um, clutter up Hereford Road. I imagine the developers would not want to do that because I'm not sure you park on Hereford Road uh, more than once. Um, and if you did try it once, you probably wouldn't buy a house there once your car's in pieces. Um, but yeah, we can certainly uh, put in a condition uh, to get that information in place. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mark. Happy with that? Yep. Yeah. Chair, may I ask that the, the details of the 278 are, sh are shared with members or particularly the, the ward member um, prior to approval? Sorry, Chair, there's, there's no hours detail. We think there'd be a control with a condition um, with information submitted, but we'll make sure that is the case if it isn't. And uh, I, I did hear you say about um, Councillor Lane being involved in a Section 278, so I made a note. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Clark, I believe you're next. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Chairman. I'm, I'm pleased to see this development come forward, and I'm pleased that we've managed to get the cables undergrounded. Um, but I'm sad that we haven't got as many affordables as we want. The thing which I'm concerned slightly about is the design appears to be fairly simplistic. We do not seem to have a lot of fenestration on the properties, and I understand from uh, our officers that that has been subject to discussion during the negotiation. Can I ask, because we haven't got the details before us of all the properties, that as usual the delegated panel can have a look at all the drawings for every house type to make sure all the details that have been agreed are there, and can we also have a look at the colours? At the moment we've got no indication on anything we've got as to the colour of the bricks, colour of the render, the colour of the tiles. So I'd, I'd like the delegated panel to have an influence on that if they, if they think it's necessary. Thank you. Did the committee uh, agree with that? Could I have a show of hands that agreed that the panel looks at all the, the details then? Right, thank you very much for that. Councillor Feekin next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a welcome, uh, a welcome site, well, well delivered. I think we might be missing an opportunity. Mark, is it possible to go back to the slide where we're showing the, um, the GI slide, I think it was? A GI plan, that's it, not any of those. Um, if we was to straighten that uh, hedgerow out, relocate that hedgerow on the access, mirroring what uh, Councillor um, uh, Phil Murphy said, uh, if we was to straighten that hedgerow out, it would improve the visibility for, site, for traffic coming in and out of the site, and also for traffic travelling on the road to, to see the visibility that there is an a, a site access there. Um, as it is at the moment, the hedgerow is quite high, and if you was travelling along that site, you wouldn't necessarily know there's uh, um, uh, a site access, and so if we were to relocate the hedge back in towards the, ha in towards the development, um, it would encourage people to naturally slow down as well as having the speed limit in place as well. That that's what I would like to recommend. Is that possible for that to also go to before the delegated panel, which is slightly more than what we're asking for the, uh, for the widening of the, uh, of, the, of the entrance, as Councillor Murphy said, um, but it's just so it doesn't fall in between the two stalls between planning and highways. So I'd like that to go back before, before delegated panel. Um, yeah, I don't think that's a problem anyway, Chair. Um, there is a hedge right along the boundary now, but it's proposed to put a footpath into that southern boundary. Um, if it lets me, I'll try just plugging in a different, uh, showing you a different screen, which we'll have a plan on. Um, so I think that's already covered, but that's not a problem, what's been requested. They can do what they usually call tra translocating the hedge, which just moves it back. And there is, as you say, land there that, to play with, so, so to speak, which is an advantage on an entrance these days. Sorry, bear with me a second, Chair. I'm sure everybody's very patient. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, so that's the access just towards the uh, the top of the slide. Um, and the light gray shading shows a new footpath going in um, and also shows in more detail and clarity the display. And you can see the, uh, the contours. Uh, so the 20 and the 30, that's the either side of the road sign. So it'd be 20 miles an hour going into the site, 30 miles an hour for traffic coming out. And um, you can see the contours along the bank where that's reduced and um, the display hatched in green and the new footpath. Um, so that probably gives you a bit more of an idea um, in terms of how that provision would be made and then the landscaping would be behind that. Okay. Right, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Brown, I think you wish to come back, please. Yeah, it's only it's only a very minor point, and obviously the debate's moved on, but I've had to wait, um, Chair, obviously, in terms of orders of speakers. Um, it was mentioned that broadband um, was essential, and obviously it would be sensible to look at cables at the same time, but um, I just wondered whether or not an informative could be added. I appreciate that a condition can't be, but I just wondered if an informative could be added on that particular aspect, because it would seem to be sensible to do so. On the health side, I mean, I also think that um, health services are essential as well as uh, broadband. Um, and I think uh, I am pleased that, uh, that on major applications that come in now that you will be consulting the health board, but uh, it wouldn't have been a major undertaking to have done it in this case, and I'm, I'm disappointed that you haven't. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Councillor Maureen Powell, Thank then I'll take Councillor Dovey, yeah. and then I think just, we will... Just a quick oh. one. Um, we have three three main sur sur surgeries in Abergavenny. I don't know about the one on Hereford Road, but the Tudor Street and North Station Road are very large sur surgeries with a good many doctors in them. So it's not a case of a, a, a little surgery with two doctors in. There are big surgeries which will cover a lot of people. We've got th three. Thank you. Sorry, could I just say, obviously, I raised that issue because the ward member raised it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I was interested in the discussion that was going on with regard to the road and the fact that it is a quite quick urban road, if, if you will. Um, a, a few years back, we had an existing problem in Chepstow, very much the same sort of route as this, two schools on it, and of course it is Well Street. Um, and uh, effectively, we uh, changed the layout of the road. Um, and, uh, I had the assistance of Mr. Paul Keeble, he was the officer, that uh, really designed it. And now it is a, a subtle uh, combination of uh, carefully placed um, quite small traffic calming items like uh, small islands. Um, there is the odd small uh, uh, ramp, if you like, a bump or whatever it is, and the pedestrian crossings. And they are all um, uh, spared at, at judicious uh, distances. Um, and it has improved the outlook of of the road completely and the fact of the matter is it is the speed is permanently monitored on the road at the moment and uh, by far the vast majority of the traffic going along that road now travels along it at less than 30 miles an hour and that was far from the case when we started off before it was a real real um, uh, travel back spot if you like and it's improved the entrance to the town in terms of the way the road looks etc it might be worth um, um, officers just um, um, uh, speaking to Paul about it and uh, and, and you can put the forward the raison d'etre of why we did Well Street that way I think there are similarities just trying to be helpful, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, as usual, Councillor Dovey. Always helpful. I think we've debated this quite long enough now. And Sorry? Yeah, he did indicate earlier on he might, might or might not. I wasn't quite sure. But if you do wish to come and sum up for two minutes, you have my permission to do so.
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I think I've listened very carefully to what's been said, and I know that there are lots of attributes to this particular development. And as Councillor Murphy said and Councillor Harris said, it is aesthetically pleasing to look at the plan compared with the Greystones plan, indeed, um, next door. And I'm comforted by some of the suggestions. There will be some safeguards, especially as relating to uh, the speed, because um, just north of where they plan to put the 30 mile an hour limit, there's another small estate. And I would be rather pleased if they could put that 30 mile an hour speed limit just beyond that estate to slow it all up before it hits the, the new proposed development. So I'd just like to add that. So I've listened very carefully to, to what's been said this afternoon. and. Um, I stand alongside with uh, a lot of the objections made by uh, Simon Griffiths earlier on, indeed, and I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Lane. Well, I think we've given it, you know, quite a good airing and discussion covering all aspects of people's concerns. And Councillor Harris, he wished to move for approval. Do you have a seconder, please? Councillor Powell seconded. it. Could I have a show of hands for approval for the application? Right, thank you indeed and thank all those at the back and uh, those who contributed to the discussion. Thank you. We now go on to the next application of the day and that is at Devorden, application 01219. Thank you, Madam Chair. This application is DC. Thank you, Craig. Oh, sorry. Perhaps you better give a couple of minutes for people to leave uh, the chamber. Apologies. That's quite all right. Right, thank you, Craig. Thank you, Madam Chair. This application is DC 2006-01219. It's for the siting of a temporary mobile home for a new rural enterprise establishment for the calf rearing business. The presentation here is the access to the site, and it's located on Oak Tree Farm, Quarry Road in Devorden. Here from this photograph, you can see the mobile home, which is located to the back there. Um, this is the field access to the site, which was previously approved as part of a, an old application. If I to go to the next slide, this is another picture of the site, which we were, which members were at yesterday. This is located in the wider area along Quarry Road. And this is a site plan of the site showing the mobile home and also the previously approved building so there's a picture of the site to so the mobile home to the west the previously approved building and approved access and septic tank go to the next slide and this is just a, a diagram of the caravan which is my mobile home which is located at the site at the moment so the applicant does seek retrospective, pass, partial retrospective planning consent for the siting of the caravan at the site to develop a calf rearing business. In order to establish the new enterprise, she has brought a field, which is planning permission, with an agricultural building, which has previously got consent on it. The applicant assigned an independent advisor to undertake an agricultural appraisal of their new enterprise, which has been fully considered as part of this application and assessed by an external rural consultant on behalf of the local planning authority. The applicant currently owns approximately 5.6 hectares of approved grassland. The applicant purchased the land in June 2000, 2016. In addition to the freehold land, she has agreed to rent a further four hectares under an open-ended formal agreement. The enterprise itself will involve the rearing of young bull calves from a week old to their slaughter at about 14 months old. The calves will be reared in batches of approximately 25, and the animals will be initially be reared on milk and then weaned at approximately 16 weeks, and will then be summer grazed. 
The calves will be purchased from local dairy farms. At about 14 months, the animals will be slaughtered, butchered, and jointed locally to produce finished meat products, which will be retailed directly by the applicant at farmers' markets and also online. The applicant may also intend to develop a mobile burger, burger van from the business. The business is a new enterprise that will be developed over the next three years. The short turnaround to produce the finished stock means that the business is capable of being sc scaled relatively quickly. The proposal is to develop a business that is both profitable and viable as the basis for a long-term agricultural venture. The applicant has outlined that they have extensive experience within agriculture and committed their own finance and time towards the project. They do have experience of running this type of business elsewhere. The applicants have submitted a detailed appraisal of the new enterprise and outlined there is a functional and financial need for workers to be located at the site. They have also out outlined that a party needs to be, be on site to monitor the health of the young calves and act quickly if there are any issues such as bloat or, or pneumonia. Also to ensure there is no fighting between the bulls and no animal escapes. The applicants have also submitted information to outline the rationale for the proposed siting of the business, which also includes the previous which it includes a previous consent for the large agricultural building and easy access to infrastru infrastructure links and local dairy farms. As outlined previously, the submitted appraisal of the case for the siting of a, of a mobile home has been assessed by an external rural consultant. In addition, a full consultation process exercise has been conducted with statutory consultees and the local community. The consultation responses are outlined in full in your report. Um, just to cover a couple of these, the Void and Community Council have recommended refusal outlining that it's a very small farm and disputes the fact the application is a viable agricultural proposition. There's also additional comments in your late correspondence uh, from Councillor Andy Williams, who questions the viability of this scheme. The Biodiversity Officer has no objections to the proposals. The Landscape Officer has also been consulted and has no objection to object to a, a condition relating to further landscaping at a later, at a later stage. The AMB office has also provided comments on the application and has outlined that the development has a moderate to slight adverse impact on the AUMB uh, and supports the Council's landscape officer's comments on the application. In terms of third party representations, there's been objections from three addresses. They outline qu quite an extensive amount of objections in your report. Um, some of these is that the development will set a precedent for other developments in the area. The applicant's previous ventures have failed. Um, Promise of additional land is unreliable. The temporary dwelling will be further be later be replaced by a permanent one. There's also been a um, appraisal conducted by Fox Rural, which is outlined in your report also, um, which has been is developed by the neighbouring parties, and it is concluded that in consideration of the, of the technical advice no six, there's no essential need for a rural enterprise dwelling. In addition to the objections, there's also been one letter of support to the development. It's worth noting at this stage that the applications for the siting of a mobile home on a temporary basis to establish the, business, the enterprise and the business is not for permanent residential unit to be sited at the site. The applications for the temporary siting of a mobile home through the assessment is supported by the terms of 4.6.2 of Technical Advice Note 6, which states that when the tests for a permanent dwelling are not completely proven, permission may be granted for a temporary accommodation for a limited period. Technical advice note recognises the need for a vibrant economy and encourages the development of new enterprises to keep the rural economy vibrant. Our external consultants' assessments therefore looked at the tests for the permanent dwelling, sections 4.4 and 4.6, but in context to the allowances in 4.6.2, which is what I've just mentioned, which gives significant support to new rural enterprise developments. I will now go through the external consultant's opinion on each criteria within section 4.6 of the technical advice notes. In relation to criteria A of 4.6.1, this outlines that clear evidence and the ability to develop the business has been submitted by the applicant. The external consultant has outlined that this is, a mar this is marginally met. He did express concerns as to whether there is clear evidence of that ability, but given that this is a temporary accommodation application with the prospect of that ability being proven over the next three years, he concluded that it has been marginally met. In reference to criteria B, which outlines there needs to be a clear evidence that the business needs to be here and cannot be elsewhere where dwelling might be available, the consult also outlined further concerns. This enterprise could be based anywhere with a road network and established markets, not just here. But this is where the applicants 
owns the land and certainly the business could not at the moment support the purchase of equivalent land with a dwelling or building her own will be less expensive than buying an already built one and will not need be built unless until a permanent permission is granted and the business should have developed by then. Being able to support such a purchase is another marginal test, which in his opinion is narrowly met, but for the temporary consent to allow the enterprise to develop, it has been met. Clear, the, th the third criteria is criteria C, outlining clear evidence that the proposed enterprise has been planned on a sound financial basis. Again, there are concerns. This type of enterprise is difficult to make successful. However, in the context of section 4.6.2, the test is whether it has been planned on a sound financial basis. The business plan is considered to be robust, but there are significant doubts if the figures are actually achievable. Given there will be three years to prove it, he concluded that despite the concerns, the test is met for temporary accommodation to try and establish the business. In respect to criteria T, which outlines that there needs to be clearly established functional and full-time need, our consultant has concluded the full-time need is passed. He is comfortable there is sufficient labour requirement to fulfil to fully employ a worker at the site. But again, the functional test is only marginally met by the numbers and type of enterprise. And again, his conclusions are further supported by the proviso in 4.6.2 that this is a temporary consent for three years to try and establish the, en the new enterprise. But to go all of this in, in the context of a temporary dwelling application and examining the policy test for temporary dwellings, as outlined in the TAN, it is apparent the TAN requ requires that where the case is not completely proven for the dwelling, then a temporary consent can be granted. The external consultant's view and officer's view that the test would not be met if this was an application for a permanent dwelling. But this isn't an application for a permanent dwelling. It's for a temporary mobile home over a period of three years to prove the viability of the, of the new enterprise. So the consultant has concluded that the tests are marginally meant, but they are met given that the technical advice now seeks to support new rural enterprises in rural areas. Therefore, the principle of citing the mobile caravan at the site to attempt to establish the new rural enterprise is considered to be acceptable and the application is recommended for approval subject to the conditions ensuring this is a temporary consent for three years for the applicant's new enterprise only. So the condition is worded in, in your report to outline that after the three years it have to be assessed if the business is being viable. There's also a condition relating to additional landscaping at the site to be planted to screen the structures as outlined in the report. Therefore, officers are recommended that, in conclusion with the consultant, that the tests are marginally met and therefore the application is recommended for approval, subject to the conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed that, for that, Mark. I believe, uh, Craig, sorry. Uh, councillor, the local councillor wishes to. Uh, uh, speak on this application, Councillor Bob Greenland. Yeah, you have six minutes and two minutes to sum up if you so wish later. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I don't myself know the applicant, but I'm quite prepared to accept that uh, there is a laudable ambition here to raise calves that might otherwise be of little value. But farmers are, are, are canny. If they could turn a few pounds by raising these calves, they would. And it's not just laudable ambitions that equate to plausible business cases. Now, this application comes to you with an officer recommendation of approval for two basic reasons. The first is that they believe that TAN 6 indicates that if a business plan is marginal, it should be given a chance on a temporary site to prove its worth. Quite right. That's what it says. Uh, the second reason they, they are approving it is because the MCC ac um, account, uh, consultant who first of all said this was not a viable plan, has changed his mind and now believes that it is. But I would ask you members to consider the evidence that you have in front of you from the business plan. This is a 14 acre site and possibly two acres of that are taken up by the yards and non-grazing area. 
The application also makes reference to further land being av available on an open-ended formal agreement. That means if it's open-ended, it cannot necessarily be relied on and should be not, not be relied on in when you're considering this business plan. And frankly, uh, Chair, 12 acres of land on which to base this business plan is nonsensical. 125 calves growing into cattle are expected to be reared on this land. The applicant says that there is going to be four months on um, milk. Then there's going to be summer grazing. 125 animals summer grazing on 12 acres of land. They say there's going to be four batches. If there's four batches, how can they all be summer grazing? This business plan indicates that it will be a low input system relying on, which has to therefore rely on a lot of grazing, a large acreage. This is not a large acreage by any means. It cannot be achieved. And furthermore, it says on the cost of the calves, £20. Anything reasonable, any reasonable calf is £100 or more. If you're paying £20 for a calf, your chances of getting it to the very high levels of, of finishing that they're saying in this business plan is simply pie in the sky. Now, the previous uh, business was in Dorset, and we're told that it was not viable because it was not direct selling. And even a friend who wrote supporting the ad, uh, um, application admitted that this is a niche market. And yet, the applicant expects to sell 125 carcasses, direct selling, internet, and a mobile van. That's a huge output, and again, it's impossible. Where are the costs, for instance, of refrigeration? If they're going to bring all these carcasses back, they need to refrigerate it. Where's the cost of transport to and from the markets? Where's the cost of postage or... or um, uh, transport for internet sales and where's the cost of the mobile van they're not in the business plan the business plan needs to demonstrate that it can uh, support a worker and every worker will eventually need housing their salary their wages need to be able to cover uh, housing and on admission of the applicant uh, she has said that she can't afford accommodation costs. If they can't be afforded in this business plan, how can they possibly be afforded in three years' time when this caravan has to go and a house has to replace it? Now, in the past, our planning officers have actually recommended refusal of an application on a large beef farm where they were carving. And now they're saying, well, they, don't need, they do need to be on site. I would, I would disagree with that entirely. Most farmers might consider that such an application um, could be shared. The capital cost, having a, having a tractor, etc., could be shared with other uh, parts of their uh, business. Not in this case. They have to, to share the whole uh, of these costs. This is a high-risk bovine TB area. Many of the farms in this area are under restrictions from TB. Several farmers nearby have been closed down. Indeed, one who came to speak to me, uh, he said that um, he had tried this enterprise, this type of enterprise. It needs such huge amounts of inputs of food that it simply will not work. I would suggest to you, uh, Madam Chair, that contrary to the MCC consultant's views, this is a cold hill site that supports sheep very well. It is not a site for such a speculative calf rearing venture. It is an excellent site for a house, but this risky venture needs a suitable land in, in a, low BT, uh, a low TB area. Madam Chair, to go forward with this application and approve it, you would face numerous other farmers hoping to set up home and business on 14 acres. And this application would have set the burden of proof dangerously low. Thank you very much, Councillor Greenland. I do believe we have also somebody from the community that wishes to speak.
please state your name and you have four minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, members, officers, and ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think I speak on behalf of everybody we know who lives around in, in our area. This application, we feel, is a property development in search of a business case to justify it. The plot in question was marketed as such, um, extolling its exceptionally beautiful setting and explicitly mentioning the possibility of building a farmhouse. It's unfortunate that technically there's no detrimental effect on someone submitting a retrospective planning application, but we hope members will recognise that the audacious disregard for planning law that the applicant has demonstrated must raise suspicions about its authenticity as being primarily a genuine new farming business, however well-meaning that those business intentions are. We're objecting to this application for the same reason that TAN6 guidance was introduced, to protect the precious, highly sought after, but rapidly diminishing countryside that we all enjoy, which should be safeguarded for the whole community, from unscrupulous chances and property developers out for their own financial interest. And this is no ordinary countryside. The Devorden Escarpment is designated a special landscape area, described as having high scenic quality, an unspoilt till now character, having high and outstanding landscape and amenity value, also set between two SSSIs. If those, this goes ahead, it sets a very dangerous precedent. One of the applicant's nearest neighbours had an application for a simple request to turn a garage into a bedroom turned down on this very point, saying it would set a precedent that would make it more difficult to resist other similar proposals. What has changed? And this is no idle threat. We've met other similarly, similarly interested parties on another plot. The three years being offered to the current applicant to prove the viability of this enterprise is crucial because the applicant might then be able to ignore MCC planning and go straight to the Welsh Government and apply under the One Planet initiative. We wish to draw members' attention to the following issues in the appraisal by Mr Anstis who is meant to be an independent consultant for MCC. In Mr Anstis's initial appraisal of the application, many of the TAN6 tests were assessed initially as not met. In Mr Anstis's recent appraisal, however, these tests have now miraculously been assessed as met. However, no further evidence has been provided, nor has anyone been able to view a revised business plan or any of the financial information that would be necessary to make a proper assessment of the viability of this business, a crucial test for overriding TAN6. So how have officers made this decision and why has this lack of evidence not been challenged? Um, another one of the TAN 6 tests is that the business should be based on a sound financial basis and the, the applicant has, uh, should be able to make a success of the business. Again, no evidence presented, quite the contrary, and the applicant has already failed at this business once. Again, it's gone from being not met to met. Another test is about the inherent suitability of the site to be tested with clear evidence required in respect of the site selection and the reason why the enterprise could not be accommodated in the, on, on an alternative site. No evidence again. Nor is there any evidence offered that other sites have been sought. But crucially, where is the evidence that the applicant must live on this site? The Agriculture and Horticultural Development Board, which has researched this farming method thoroughly, told us it wasn't necessary and quoted DEFRA to the same effect. The applicant is welcome to rent a room cheaply at our property if she wishes. The applicant pleads poverty as the reason for living in the bungalow. But it seems that she owns two other properties elsewhere in the country, runs two cars, grazes two horses, and has spent somewhere we reckon in the region of eighty to hundred thousand pounds plus on the land, the infrastructure, none of which is in part is, is part of the business plan provided. Finally, the decision to approve this application is based on wanting to support new businesses, but surely this is one that could be run and tested without living on site. Surely the business will go ahead regardless of whether or not approval is awarded or not. This application is full of holes, contradictions, and is frankly a disgrace, and we hope members have the independence of mind to oppose the recommendation for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. his mind there was two supplementary papers submitted i believe in december of 16 and march of this year which overcame richard Anderson's first um concerns 
The applicant has worked successfully in agriculture for many years. It's her livelihood. It's, it's not a hobby. She wants to establish a family-run farm on the site, and her son will soon join her as soon as he completes his agricultural consult, um, course at Lackham College, where he's a top student himself. I won't discuss the details of the application. I think um, you can see that all from the submission. But what I would say that is it's been agreed with the officer and their expert, Mr Anstis, that the enterprise meets all the tests of TAN 6. I can't agree that the application is finely balanced as we consider that the evidence sent with the application, along with the, the fact there's a law, the approval for a large agricultural building on site, as well as there being plenty of land for the business, means there can be no doubt that the enterprise meets all the tests. The applicant has also has the opportunity to rent additional land when and if required. Judy James ran an enterprise from Dorset, but simply the business outgrew the land and she needed to relocate. This wasn't based on having to remain in Dorset, but it was based on finding land that was suitable size and could pr provide for future expansion. Of all the potential sites, it was the applicant application site that met her needs. The Planning Commission for an Agriculture Building further attracted her. Miss James has past experience of success and has numerous qualifications and awards, the details of which have already been submitted. There's also been various newspaper articles about her, as well as many letters of support, including one listed in the committee report from Mark Burnell, who is the Clinical Director of Synergy Farm Health. Judy James is serious about farming, and she has a great deal of past experience. She wants the opportunity for the farming enterprise to expand and become successful, which is what TAN6 aims to do, support living and working rural communities. We understand that the neighbours employed an agricultural consultant to prepare a report, which we have responded to. However, if the council have instructed an agricultural consultant and both he and the appellant's consultant agree that the enterprise meets the relevant tests, then we consider that these opinions should carry significantly more weight. In summary, it's been agreed between the applicants and the council's agricultural consultants that all tests set out in TAN 6 have been met and that the applicant should be given the opportunity to prove that the enterprise will become a success. After all, this is the aim of granting a temporary planning permission in accordance with TAN 6. We are not applying for a permanent dwelling. The applicant should be granted a temporary permission so that she and her son have the opportunity to develop a well-run family enterprise. And I hope that the committee agrees with the officer's recommenda recommendation for approval. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Murphy, first, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. And um, I have to say I'm really concerned about this application, um, not, uh, not, not least because of the way that the, uh, the uh, soil and, and stone has been dumped in, around the, the place. The, the cost of removal and reinstatement of that are, are going to be con considerable. And so far, nobody's nobody's mentioned that as additional costs. But looking at the realities here, uh, planning already exists on this land, uh, so that must stand. But having said that, it was given in respect of a much larger holding where the uh, development was far more appropriate than it is on this much smaller holding now. So. Uh, to say that uh, that um, the scale of the development is commensurate with the with with, with the size of the uh, plot, I don't think applies anymore. I recognise that it did before, but nevertheless, I don't think it does now. Um, having said that, as I say, uh, the permission goes with the land, and that land had that permission on it, so I accept that it that it does have uh, planning. And if that went to uh, to uh, appeal, uh, I know that the inspector would allow it. Um, the other thing that I'm uh, concerned about there is that the access is very poor for this type of development. Uh, a shed on that larger farm that would probably uh, not have such as an intensive amount of use uh, would probably be more appropriate. Um, I can accept that a three-year consent would be desirable in, in, in uh, terms of getting the uh, business uh, up, up and running. 
but I would have to say that there is absolutely no justification whatsoever for any future application for any type of uh, dwelling there. Uh, calves under those uh, circumstances only need looking at night and morning. Uh, they, they, they don't need a, a permanent presence. And uh, a new property there certainly couldn't be justified by the uh, by the business case, even if the business turned out to be uh, uh, viable. Um, so turning to the business model, um, I think I can possibly say it's probably one of the worst business models and cases I have ever seen in some 40 years of being a practicing accountant. Um, it takes absolutely no account whatsoever of the real costs of uh, acquiring the, these uh, animals, never mind an awful lot of the points that have been uh, brought out. Our consultant considered it just okay, um, but it seems to me that there is a great deal of doubt over that, um, and um, I, I really don't see how that land, which is clearly sheep land, as, as Councillor Green has said, uh, lends itself to that number of, of, of uh, cattle. In fact, I don't see how it lends itself to cattle at all. Um, and I fear that if the venture failed, uh, we'd have a real problem on, on our hands here. Uh, we'd have a, a very large shed, uh, and it would be doubtful as to what the uh, the alternative use for it could be. Although, except that could happen anywhere, but we're talking about here. Um, so, as I say, I'm clear that on appeal it would be allowed. Uh, so I must consider uh, approving it. Um, but I am so unsure about the viability issue and I've got so many questions over over how the animals would be acquired and and, and looked after on, on this. Um, I would like a lot more information on that before I made that uh, decision. So I do recognise why officers have recommended this for uh, approval um, and I can see uh, how any um, appeal would succeed, um, but I'm most uh, most uh, concerned about approving it, given the present information. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Giles Howard. Thank, thank you, Chairman. I, I, I share Councillor Murphy's concerns and agree with almost all of his comments, by the one where he thinks it, it, it would uh, succeed on, on appeal. Um, I've, I've got a number of, of, of points I'd like to be um, on, answered, please, and they relate to the, the tests within TAN 6, um, para 461, and paragraph B, um, and the need to establish that the new enterprise cannot be accommodated elsewhere, almost like a sequential test, really. We're being asked to make a judgment in the absence of any evidence to, to, to prove this. Uh, second point, then, and it's uh, paragraph C, or rather point C, how can this can be can, can, how can this can be considered financially viable when the barn and caravan are not factored into the costing? Um, I refer then to paragraph four ten two in TAN six, um, uh, which is about the financial test. And as part of that paragraph, it says a financial test is also necessary to assess the size of a dwelling which the enterprise can afford to build and maintain. The other point, uh, and it's not, ref unless I've made a, a mistake and misread the report, I, I see no reference within it to paragraph 4.7, uh, Rural Enterprise Dwelling Appraisals, and it says that planning applications for new permanent and temporary rural enterprise dwellings in the open countryside need to be sort of supported by robust ev evidence, and an appraisal must accompany planning applications for this type of development. I, I, I don't see any evidence of that at all, and the, the issue about the, the, the functional test, the time test, the financial test, which also picked up on in the, the previous paragraph, aren't, aren't referenced um, at, at all. Um, the, the last point then, the, the, the barn, Councillor Murphy um, noted the works on site that we, we saw in the massive hole in the ground, which looks a lot larger than the footprint that the, uh, the, the barn itself would, would take. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like some kind of answers to, to how the original application was, 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 was dealt with or, or received, and I'm assuming it was a, a prior notification. Oh, okay, well, I won't go any further with that point because Mark's um, in, in indicated that it wasn't. But, I'd, but certainly I feel that the, the tests haven't been met. There's an absence of any reference to paragraph 4.7. I'm surprised that the, 
the report has, has, has come here without that. And, and so I, I'd, I'd move refusal. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Councillor Blakeborough, then Councillor Alan Davis. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, a lot of the uh, issues have been covered um, by uh, my two colleagues here. Um, I'm not a former. Um, I, I mean, when I first looked at it, I, I was a little bit concerned because it just seemed as if there was, it was a loophole to building an open countryside. Um, and we have to balance um, the economy in terms of tourism with the economy via a new uh, a new enterprise and that that's what I have in my mind trying to kind of balance those two um, when you're looking at the TAN 6 the criteria for uh, going off piste because that's basically what this is um, it, it's um, uh, it, it has to be really justified um, and, and satisfy the criteria. This is what it says. Yet we are constantly being told by everybody that the tests marginally meet the criteria, marginally. Uh, one of them, um, which I kind of look and um, it's quite pivotal for me, is this business plan. Um, and um, interesting um, that the agricultural consultant, MCC uh, consultant, said, uh, well, first of all, said it's a, sound, it's a robust business plan, um, but doubt that the figures can be achieved. That's not a robust business plan then, is it? So um, to me, I think it's so borderline, we've got to be very, very careful because it's so easy for anybody to buy a piece of land up and say, in order to run my enterprise, I need to live here. I think we've got to get this right. And for me, I haven't got enough evidence or information uh, in order to make that decision. I'm very, very doubtful of the business plan. Um, I would be very uncomfortable of, of approving this. Thank you, Councillor Blake. But Councillor Alan Davis first, then Councillor Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I probably know as much about farming as Councillor Greenland knows about operating a blast furnace, so I'm, I'm not here as a, an expert on farming, but I do know a little bit about business and business plans, and I have to concur that this is probably the weakest business plan I've ever seen. There's, there's, there's certainly not sufficient detail on there. Um, we have to balance here between somebody who wants to set a business is you know we, we try to encourage new business but we, there are risks with any new business but we have to balance is this an acceptable risk and does the business plan reflect that this is an acceptable risk and are all the details contained within that plan that should be there i, I find it difficult to understand how the mcc officer has said that this is a viable business plan because certainly to my mind it is not a viable business plan thank you madam chair <coughs> thank you councillor councillor lewis brown Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, I'd be happy um, to uh, second refusal on this particular application. I don't think it meets um, uh, the functional need test because I don't think there's necessarily a need to have somebody on site on a full-time basis for this type of um, enterprise. I'm not, not a farming expert, but I did notice that one of our witnesses said that they'd... Um, one of the objectors has said that they've taken advice in relation to this. Um, the other thing is, is obviously the obviously the um, business plan is extremely weak, as other people have said. I mean, the officer said it was marginal. I mean, just actually looking at the facts in the uh, in the start of this um, thing, it was mentioning about a a 14 month time between between the period of when um, they started and when um, effectively they would be able to be slaughtered and sold. And yet the business plan doesn't allow anything like that time period before you're actually re reaping the benefits of an income. So it's actually uh, for anybody to, to look at that business plan and say that it's uh, not weak, um, hasn't even worked out the logic of... Um, how long it takes to actually have a lead in time before you get any profit. So I think for those reasons, I would um, uh, second a, a refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Harris and Councillor Powell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, Councillor Brown's just got to the uh, point that worried me uh, uh, more than uh, anything uh, in the report. And there were lots of things in the report that... Uh, uh, worried me. Um, the uh, consultant, having seen um, and and agreed with the uh, applicant that 
what information she'd given him can't possibly uh, be right, says in the report he's now got some clarification and everything's all right. Well, we don't know what that clarification is. If it was that bad in the first place, um, you know, I, I, I can't rely on that uh, uh, as a member of the planning committee to uh, to make a, a, a valid uh, uh, a consideration. Uh, and from whatever else I've uh, seen here, uh, I'm extremely um, concerned about this, and and, and I will be. Uh, one of the members that won't be voting for this. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Councillor Maureen Powell. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's, it's quite a few years now since I've been farming, but I did farm constantly for 25 years. And I have known over the years cases where there has been farming enterprises, probably with 7,500 sheep on them, and they've applied for a permission to have either a temporary or permanent building there to live in to care for these sheep on mo far more acres than this and it's been put, pulled uh, turned down many times and i cannot see how you can say you've got a plan in front of you which i i'm not an expert like council murphy who they say isn't a good business plan i'm just looking at it as a straight basic thing you haven't got the enterprise there the building isn't even built yet and they're con trying to convince us that they've got a, a viable business there I, I just cannot think about it because I do not think that it would work. And uh, uh, to put, to, I know it's not the actual application. The application is to have a temporary building there, temporary dwelling. But it's going to rely on whether the business works or not, and I just don't think it will. Thank you, Councillor Powell. Councillor Feakin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have the benefit of being a farmer still uh, and having been brought up a farm on a farm for most of my life. Um, the business case for this application doesn't stack up, I'm afraid, in my mind. Um, we always allow one cow per acre. Um, so 12 to 14 acres would give you 12 to 14 cows from a grazing. They're asking for 125 cows. Um, I think that that sort of rings alarm bells in my ears to start with. Um, it breaks my heart that we shouldn't give or allow everyone the opportunity to start a business, especially in the rural, rural enterprise area. Um, that being said, this business could be started without living on site. The arguments for bloat and or pneumonia uh, are, are, in my mind, aren't valid. Um, having lived on a farm most of my life, you know, we, we can attend to the animals from seven o'clock, six o'clock in the morning through to 11 o'clock at night without having to be on site. We can travel to a building and back from a building. Um, it's proposed that there will be electricity on site, so it's not that you can't be lights on within the building. Um, so neither the cases of bloat nor pneumonia would, would give rise to having to live on site. Carving cows, maybe, um, but uh, for, the, for the arguments of living on site, it doesn't stack up to me. So two things don't equate. Um, the the dense stocking density per, per, for, the, for the unit um, and also the reasons for having to live on site. The business case is arguable um, in my mind. Um, I wouldn't want to, uh, it's not for me to say whether you would or wouldn't venture in that regard. Um, but, uh, but, you know, but based on, based on simply on those two issues, for the stocking densities, for the number of cattle on site, uh, and, and the reasons for having to live on site, I would move that we, uh, that we refuse the application. Thank you, Councillor Fikin. Councillor Jim Higginson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, uh, my family had a small holding some years ago, and it was uh, considerably bigger than that. And uh, admittedly, it wasn't beef and that sort. It was uh, chickens, ducks, geese, and that type of thing. And uh, after a few years, they decided to give it up. I, I was there yesterday with everyone else, and on what I saw, I, I have to say, I, I, and I, I would find it difficult to believe that a business could succeed in that particular area. And I, I, you're looking at the council's agriculture the agricultural consultant has reviewed the pro proposal in detail and following lengthy discussions and so on, the considers that uh, TAN paragraph 461 are met. Then further on down, as uh, Richard Anstis considers the test to be met, and paragraph 462 of TAN 6 clearly outlines that a rural enterprise should be given the opportunity to become successful. I wouldn't argue against that, 
But uh, the, from my point of view, I don't think it would be successful in that particular area. Thank you very much, Councillor. And the extent of the ground available as well. Thank you, Councillor. Well, I'm just wondering uh, if the sun has gone to Lackham College and, is a, as stated by the agent, is a, a high-achieving student, who would have advised them if they had advice and if they had long experience in agriculture with a business like this, why they would have um, put the caravan or mobile home on that sort of land for beef enterprise uh, because the land isn't suitable and it's very cold up there as well, which isn't going to be good. Um, so the, the land would not be suitable for this type of as we said, and Councillor Green said, it is sheep land, not cattle land. And a lot of it, if you turn them out, they'll jig it up and poach it, and then you, it does not recover then for the next lot to graze, if, if it's done in batches. Um, as you know, I've been farming all my life. Uh, I don't wish to uh, come to this meeting other than with an open mind, and I do think everybody should have a chance to start a new business, but hopefully with a good business plan for their own sakes that it does stack up for when they go into this venture, because in farming it is a long, hard business to make a living out of it. And there is no need for someone to be there 24-7. Um, I know that for a fact. But, uh, and I do wish any youngster, because we, we do need them in agriculture, but I do not think that this really stacks up or that they were given bad advice. And if you were going to set up a caravan, retrospectively, why do it in a field like this? I'm sorry, I cannot support the application. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I know nothing about farming uh, at, at all. Um, but I do know a, a bit about looking at a business case and whether it, uh, it r rings true or whether it cracks like a duck. And uh, to be truthful, this is a business case. I think is incredibly frail. I have only to listen to what uh, people here, uh, fellow councillors, say uh, who have experience of, 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 of farming. And the fact that uh, the, what is being put in front of us now is said to be marginal, but that's good enough. I think it is, is not good enough. And um, I'm all in favor of refusing this. And I wouldn't be worried about having it appealed either because by what I've heard today, I would think if this case went for appeal, uh, I, don't think, I don't think they'd win, because I, I think it, the case is so poorly served, so I would definitely not vote in favor of this. Councillor Feekin. Sorry to come back, but thank you, Chair. Um, just to, just to uh, come, back, come back to page then, is that by refusing this application today, it does not remove the possibility for any young family or, or for the farmers of that site to establish an enterprise or to make a go of that enterprise. Uh, it doesn't remove that at all. It just means they're not going to live on site to do it. Um, and like I said, I don't think they need to live on site to do it. So we're not removing the opportunity for someone to establish a business in the countryside. We're just making sure that uh, it's, it's done in accordance with policy. Yeah, but as we said, the business case does not really stack up. And it's also, um, if there is TB in the area, that'll kill a small business striving anyway. And I don't know whether they're going to castrate these bulls, because if they don't, they're going into some very high jinx uh, in 14 months. Um, I believe it's been moved by somebody. Oh, yes, Councillor Green. And sorry, do you wish to sum up, please, for two minutes? Uh, in view of members' comments, uh, Madam Chair, I don't think I need to, but I would just reiterate, this is an application just for a temporary home which is being considered. It doesn't stop somebody with enterprise wanting to try a business venture, but um, not living on the site, which is not necessary. Thank you for that clarification, Councillor Greenland. Councillor Murphy. Uh, just to clarify my position, Chair, I did say earlier that uh, I would need additional information before making my mind up. It's quite clear what the vote is going to be, uh, but I shall be abstaining uh, because of the lack of that additional information. Thank you. Councillor Blakeborough. 
Right. So you've moved. You you've. Yes, you've moved to have a refusal. Do you have a second of a refusal? Yes. Councillor Brown, the second. Yeah, I thought I'd already. I thought uh, Councillor Giles had uh, put forward uh, to refuse it. I don't think we'll fall out over the Sorry, fact. Sorry, Councillor Howard. Right, thank you. So Councillor Howard, he was the first one then to uh, suggest that it's up for refusal and Councillor Brown to second it. Okay, everybody agree with that? Uh, so could I have a show of hands, please, for refusal? So that's uh, 12 for refusal, Chair. And there is one abstention. Abstention, right. The application's refused, Chair. Right, thank you. Last applicant. Well, I'll wait for the members to, uh, or the public to clear the chamber. Chairman, you may want to remind members of the public that it will come back now and the yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, members of the public, as that was against the recommendations of the officers for they wanted it to be approved, it will come back now next month for the reasons for approval, for, for refusal. So if that's you're all clean, if that's keen to understand the procedures for planning. Thank you. Thank you. Could you please hurry in, in clearing the chamber because we've got quite several uh, items still on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Right, members, we have some SPGs to discuss now. Um, oh, sorry, we have an application yet. It seems to have been a very long, although we thought it was very few applications on today, but it was only three, and we've been here now for over two hours. <laughs> um, the last one is 00771, and this is at Caldicott. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this application seeks retrospective planning permission for the change of use of agricultural land to storage and distribution in connection with an existing business at Barrier Services, the Elms, Cowan, Brook, Caldicott. It's one that members visited yesterday. Uh, that's a, a photograph of the site uh, from the access lane. Members recall it's at the end of, um, uh, of a lane um, the, the, with, um, whoops, yeah. Um, yeah, it's the 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 back end of the site there that you can see um yeah you can do it hang on does it work no nope. <laughs> <laughs> you better do it uh right the business has operated from this site for 28 years and the area of land in question was put into use four years ago um, there's been no expansion of the business and no increase in either employees or vehicles However, the need to expand the compound was in response to health and safety and standards imposed on the company from outside agencies. The new compound is an exa expansion of the old one and measures 4,050 um, 4, square metres. It's enclosed by security fencing and accessed via the existing compound. It's used for the storage of materials and parking of vehicles as we saw yesterday. The site is well screened from any residential properties at the end of a lane and considered to have minimal impact on the visual amenity of the area. The site is relatively isolated with the nearest property 0.2 miles away and therefore considered not to be harmful to any party's residential amenity. There's no highway objection as this is an established business which has not resulted in additional vehicular movements on the local highway network. The Highway Authority has not received any complaints over the last four years and the business has functioned for 28 years without any reported problems. Officers therefore recommend approval of this application. Thank you, Paula. Uh, Phil, is this your award, please? Councillor Murphy? Yes, thank you, Chair. And the reason that um, this has come before the committee is that the um, although um, MCC may not have had any complaints the Community Council very certainly have. Um, 
there's a great deal of concern uh, but with the residents that live up the, the lane uh, about the size and, uh, and speed of vehicles. Uh, that seems to have got more. Uh, the evidence from uh, the company uh, is that um, that isn't the uh, case and indeed they're not even operating to the amount of vehicles that they uh, that uh, include in their um, their operator's license um, the the feeling locally is that um, the uh, uh, that's, pro that's, that this that's probably making more sense. Um, <laughs> the uh, the feeling uh, locally is that this uh, this business has uh, has outgrown its 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 site. Um, uh, but that said, um, I accept that it's been there a long time. I do understand that some more land has been acquired. Uh, but I now understand from yesterday's meeting that if that's uh, developed, it will be subject to a uh, planning application at the time, and it will replace the existing site um, uh, in a, in a more suitable uh, p position. So um, uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm quite content that um, the retrospective uh, permission is is given. Um, and the, uh, uh, particularly because the company is now uh, being very cooperative over uh, complaints that are made uh, uh, by the residents in the area. So um, I think that pretty well sums it up. Good Councillor Murphy. Councillor Howard? In an effort to prove that I'm not going to be entirely unhelpful this afternoon, I'd like to move approval. I think I, I understand the, the issues with the, and the complaints in the Community Council regarding the traffic, but as far as the application is concerned, that's more of a sideshow because there's no in intensification or ex extended use of the site. The number of vehicles being stored is the same. I did put, uh, put the question yesterday about whether the porter cabin and the vehicle wash should have consent, but perhaps if we're going to approve this, it wouldn't be expedient to, to, to follow that any further, so I'll be happy to move approval. Thank you. I'd already highlighted that uh, issue of the cabins with the officers yesterday, but that is not part of this application that we're dealing with. Uh, Councillor Hick Jim Higgins and then Councillor Harris. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. I mean, what I can say about that site prior to its expansion or this expansion is that uh, they were certainly, as a neighbouring authority, there were concerns with the Caligot Cali Town Council uh, about, the, about the nature of it. I have to say, and he was a different proprietor then, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would go along with the members who have set, you know, suggested approval in this case, but there is, the, you know, the issue around that being, that uh, business being where it is, is the disturbance and everything else attached to that, the, the dangerousness as well of vehicles traversing that lane. It's a very narrow lane without any shadow of doubt and I see I, and they have an art, articulated vehicle unless they got rid of it since, since I saw it last but there are articulated vehicles using that lane and clearly they're not suitable for, uh, to, uh, you know, for to traverse that lane for, you know, for any uh, extent of time. Uh, to go back to something that was said about they the, the purchase another, another site, um, uh, would, uh, fine, and I, I don't disagree with the comments made about that, uh, but I think the sooner that they realise that that site is not suitable for the type of business and the type of vehicles that are using it, uh, then the better, and uh, if we can encourage them to move from there, I think we should. Thank you, Councillor Higgins. Councillor Harris? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It's interesting, you know, articulated vehicles uh, uh, apparently, if I've read it correctly, have been uh, using this lane for 28 years, So, uh, but I don't know if I'm right there. Uh, going back to um, the accommodation, I've got the relevant planning history in 2004 gave permission for a two-story rear extension to form offices and ancillary accommodation so i don't know if that's the block that we uh, saw if it is it's got permission according to this it's on the relevant planning history on page 55. if i can just in interject there uh, chair the that is on to, to to the original house which was beyond where we were. right okay so you wouldn't have seen that lodge. okay 
Okay, Roger. Yes, right. right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Alan Davis, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, there was concern also about uh, a very much increased delivery vehicles coming to the site. Uh, there was a lot more stored there than there was originally. Uh, and I'm also told that Councillor Murphy will, will back me up, but these articulated lorries are much bigger than they used to be. So I think there are, those concerns are there. I'm not an expert on planning. I'm a new member of this committee. I, 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 I am bothered by retrospective planning because at the end of the day, the residents were, were not consulted when, this initial, uh, when they initially took the decision to change this into a storage area, and it's a very large area. So I think, you know, by doing that, they are circumnavigating the system and not allowing the residents really to have their say before they actually do it. Um, I will be voting against approval on the basis that uh, there was no adequate consultation originally when they did it. Thank you. Thank you. Mark likes to comment now, please. Sorry, Chair. Can I just come back on that point? Um, I, I completely understand the frustration in the community with retrospective applications. Um, it's a it's a recurring theme, um, but the guidance is really clear that we have to just consider them um, as though the applications before us, as though they've gone through the proper channels. We can't penalise them or treat them differently for what they have done. Um, sometimes it's deliberate. Sometimes it's accidental. Um, it is just one of those facts of planning life, unfortunately. So we just have to. Uh, make a decision based on um, usual planning considerations. The fact it's already there shouldn't count against them. Equally, shouldn't count for them. So the fact they may have wasted a lot of money doing something um, shouldn't sway in their favour either. Um, so just to clarify that, I understand it is frustrating um, for communities, but we can't um, use our, our planning decision-making powers to somehow punish them or treat them differently. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, there being consultation on this application when it's come in, not in advance of the event by definition, um, but there's been consultation as part of our usual process. Thank you, Mark. Councillor Clark? Yeah, those of us who went there, yes, had you looked at your verges on the way in and the way out, they were totally unscathed. Not one lorry had mounted a verge on the whole length of that road. And, and with that, Councillor Clark, as you know, I have been a dairy farmer all my life and we live up a long, narrow lane. <coughs> Years ago, you had a lorry come in with churns on it, but now it is arctics. They do come up the lane, the farm machinery is bigger, you can't do anything about it as Councillor Higginson goes somewhere else. No, you can't do that with a lot of businesses, but you do have to be mindful that the traffic today is far bigger and there's not an awful lot you can do with it sometimes to, to, uh, to service a, a business like this is as well. Councillor Dovey, then Councillor Feakin. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, th there was a point that was made yesterday and it hasn't been made today uh, um, as far as I can remember. And that is that the vehicles, the largest vehicles that come in here and exit from here are articulated but it, and, and they come to deliver. The vehicles that are in and out of the site all the time are rigid and very much smaller. The point that uh, uh, Peter made is a very valid one, that mo most uh, big uh, load vehicles nowadays are articulated, and they're articulated because they are more m maneuverable for the loads that they carry um, to get in and out of anywhere. Um, it, it is remarkable how agile these, these, these vehicles are today. And the other thing I will support uh, uh, Peter again is I, went, I walked up the lane yesterday and there was no uh, visible signs of there being any damage done up there. I'm sure they are a, a, a worry to um, uh, the local uh, public there, but I don't see any evidence there that the, the vehicles that are going in and out of there are causing damage. And I suspect they don't come in and out as often as the vehicles they use to run in and out uh, do. And I have sympathy with the local residents. But the fact of the matter is, you know, a, a businesses have got to have room to flourish. We, we need business to uh, work in the county. And I, I think 
um, this uh, this business is is a good neighbour to the people that are there. It looks a, a clean and tidy business for what it is. I had a look at the trucks. The trucks look all well kept. Um, you know, uh, I just think they're doing a, a hard day's work, and uh, it's a difficult thing. But I I I, I cannot see a downside to what they're doing, put it that way. There might be a thought that you, you uh, uh, um, uh, Mark would be able to tell us if this is so, that we put a weight limit on the, can we put a weight limit on the vehicles that go in and out of there? Um, or can we put a time, a specified time when they don't go in and out, say, during the night? But. Uh, it depends on the nature of how their business runs and uh, what the uh, highway laws say. But uh, those are the only two suggestions that I have. Chair, my, I might be wrong. My understanding with um, weight restrictions is they wouldn't apply to vehicles delivering within the zone anyway. It's for through traffic. Um, but either way, the front of the site has a long-standing planning permission. So we can't stop anything from delivering to that. Um, so I'd suggest it's a little bit futile. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Feakin, I think, next, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, we're asked to consider this as if it's coming before us, um, as if it wasn't, that, you know, as if as it's a fresh application, um, and not to consider the retrospective element, um, which I completely agree with. Um, but if this was coming before us now, I think that we would be discussing or looking at the, the implications of ground surface water. Um, uh, what's happening to the surface water as it hits that? There's lorries on site. Uh, is there any bunding in place? Is there any oil separators in place? Um, do we know the pathways and receptors for any sort of environmental contamination? So should we be passing this maybe subject to an environmental assessment? Um, and so we have a better understanding of the um, potential pollutants and potential contaminants which could run off of that site. Um, because it is more than just a storage site, it's a lorry site, there's vehicles which are operating in that site as clearly visible in front of us. Uh, so I think that, that um, like I say, if it was coming before us as a, as a fresh application, I think we would definitely have some sort of environmental impact assessment or environmental assessment to, to, to tell us uh, what those um, implications are going to be. So I would move for approval, but subject to an environmental assessment. Thank you, Councillor Feakin. Councillor Maureen Powell? Yeah, I think people get the wrong idea sometimes about lorries. Uh, Councillor Clark said how it hasn't damaged the sides. In actual fact, somebody driving along there in a car is going to be far, sa oh, sorry, far safer meeting one of those lorries. They can see them coming. The lorries will be going slowly. If they go around those small roads and meet other cars that have got no responsibility going fast, they're more likely to have a mishap. So it, it's only the inconvenience that it's going to cause, not a danger. And regards to uh, the pollutants, I would think running a firm like that, they would keep their lorries serviced and in good working order all the time, and they would have proper pits and um, servicing areas, if not there, somewhere else. So, you know, they, they wouldn't just leave it drip anywhere. Thank you. Well, it's been a very long established, is it 28 years or something? So it seems rather I ironic that it's come to, to us now with, with queries about it. So um, if everybody has finished discussing it, Councillor Murphy is in your ward. Do you wish to move? Move approval. A second of Councillor Murphy. Councillor David Dovey at the end then. Okay, show of hands for approval, please. I don't know whether we should be saying about the conditions that Councillor Feakin, do you, can you do anything about that, Mark, or not? Um, I'd advise against putting on any kind of condition like that. Um, I think the last time we put that kind of condition on a retrospective consent was border waste and the pile of manure. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. the uh, unravelings we're still trying to do there. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so no, would be my suggestion. It's I, been in operation like this for four say, years yes. as well. So any query of worry about that would have arisen, I think, long before now. So we've had a show of hands. Sorry, could I do the count again, please, for approval? 11, 11 for the chair. Right, thank you. And those against? Two against. <laughs> right. Yes, thank you very much, Rob, for that.
We've got now some SPGs, and Mark will present those. Yeah, or, sorry, or Sarah. I, I did just say border waste then, Jay, by accident. I meant uh, rich house stables. Um, yeah, there's a couple more items for anyone escapes. Um, a couple of appeals we'll do really quickly, SPG as well. Um, but then hopefully we'll remember we've got MHA who have been sat patiently outside for an hour, and we're going to talk to us about uh, uh, a new housing proposal idea. So we will need to speed it up a little, please, uh, members. Move. <laughs> so, Chair, we'll do the appeals first, please. Okay, right, thanks, Paula. Chair. Yeah, I'll do a quick uh, run through. We've had three appeal decisions, um, all enforcement um, appeals, which they've all been upheld, uh, which is really good news. Uh, the first one is the Chain Bridge Inn, which members have often commented as we drive past in the bus about the condition of the site with all the, the vehicles and uh, the scrap metal. Uh, so we served an enforcement notice to um, to get rid of all the vehicles, scrap metal, lorries, caravans, etc. And the inspectors have held that decision, and uh, they now have to remove them by uh, by November. So that's a really good appeal decision. Uh, 23 Clearview uh, in Shinewton. This was um, a householder where he applied to replace a boundary wall with a retaining wall. Uh, we told him it was too high and uh, he put in an amended scheme which we subsequently approved a delegated panel. Um, but uh, he actually built what he wanted to build in the first place. It was far too high. Uh, so we served an enforcement notice. The inspector agreed with us that it was too high and it was unacceptable. It was excessive, overbearing and incongruous in the street scene. So he now has to, to uh, take it down and to rebuild it as per our previous approval. So that's a really good decision. And the third one, it's, um, it's our concealment case up in Tigoitra in Pandi, uh, where uh, members may recall that um, a gentleman built a house within a barn and hid it from us. Uh, for and for many, several years made comments that he had no place to live, he was on somebody's sofa, needed somewhere to live. And um, in uh, 2016, he came in with a lawful development certificate saying, ta-da, I've been living here for more than four years, it's now lawful, which um, we refused on the basis of concealment. We served an enforcement notice for him to demolish it. And uh, the inspectors agreed with us that there, were, there was positive uh, deception there. Um, many um, statements um, that he had no place to live. He hid it from us, uh, both visually and you know, in his comments. Uh, so he has now lost his appeal and he has to demolish uh, his, his dwelling within 12 months. So that's three very good enforcement appeals there. Paul, I believe uh, Councillor Brown wishes to comment most probably on the Shine Newton one. Yeah, it was on the Clearview one. Um, there was a comment somewhere within there, and I can't remember where it was, about the inspector saying that um, there's a highways issues, but that's up to highways. And I just wondered if you knew any more about um, what, what action highways were taking. Um, yeah, that, that is a, a matter for our highway, highways colleagues. Um, it is the wall that he's built does slightly encroach onto our highway. So that isn't something that we can deal with under the planning legislation. It's, it's for our highways comments. So, uh, uh, Paul. I don't, we don't know, I'm sorry. Thank you. Now back to you, Mark. Right, thank you, Sarah. Okay, so the first SPG relates to the draft SPG on rural conversions to a residential or tourism use, specifically policies H4 and T2. And the reason we're here today is just to report back on the results of the consultation. That was undertaken for six weeks from the 1st of June to the 13th of July, and the full details of which are provided in the committee report. Um, we received a total of eight replies, again, a summary of which is provided along with the Council's response in Appendix 2. Um, generally, there were no significant objections received and only minor amendments to the SPG have been necessary. There's one key change that's been made in relation to additional detail to provide clarification on the minimum size of rural conversions to a residential use. And it's recommended that the most appropriate approach would be to utilise guidance set out in the Department for Communities and Local Government technical housing standards for a one-bedroom, two-person property because there isn't any guidance within Wales at the moment. 
Um, paragraph 3.17 of, of the SPG subsequently has been updated to state the minimum size of a building suitable for um, residential use would be 50 square metres. But it's also noted that um, the minimum size of a building suitable for tourism purposes is, could be smaller than this um, because they're not big enough for permanent occupation. And full details of the change is set out in relation to representation 3.2 in Appendix 2. The amended SPG incorporating the minor changes arising from the consultation is set out in Appendix 3. And it's considered that the draft SPG could be formally adopted as SPG to support the LDP. Right, thank you, Sarah. The one thing there, when you say it's uh, 50 square metres, was it for dwelling? Is that without having a modest extension or not? Um, it's, in it's in total, sorry. So that's um, 50 square metres. It's suitable for a one-bedroom, one two-person property. But, but could they still have a modest extension? No, it, it's that, incorporated that's going into in it. entirety. Yeah, and right. the SPG would obviously need to be considered then if they put forward any extensions yeah. in the yeah. future. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Right. Uh, uh, Councillor Feakin. Thank you, Chair. Just very quickly, does that 50 metres include outside space as well, or is that 50 mm. metres of living it's space? It's just for the building. Right, Mark. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, similar theme, it's just to bring back to you the, um, the tourism SBG. Um, we've been out to consultation. Um, there weren't any substantive changes that we thought needed to be made as a result of the consultation responses. Um, so we proposed, with committee's endorsement, to take that back to the Economy and Development Select Committee. Um, the only reason that one's going through that route is it came from some work they were doing about a year ago so take it back to e and d select with any comments from planning committee um and then it will go on to cabinet member for uh, for adoption okay uh, councillor brown just um on page um i make it one seven oh sorry one six five um you'll see that there is that comment um, from the health board and then which says, when providing additional housing, uh, ABHB requests that prior consultation be given in respect of the health needs of the population in the identified areas. A large increase in housing population will have an impact on existing health care provision. This will need to be considered in the health board's future service planning. And I thought I'd wrote that, but it was actually the health board. And that was the bit I was referring to before. But the comment there was that... Um, uh, there is subsequently no need to, uh, basically there's no, um, won't amount to a significant increase. And then it says that the health board will nevertheless be consulted on future changes in the LDP revision in relation to any additional large housing sites. But I thought we'd actually agreed that um, from now on that we would have that consultation anyway, you know, so that's, that's not saying what we've uh, already agreed in the minutes of this committee. Chair, now what, what, what um, I understand we've agreed in this committee is we'll consult them on major applications, so 10 dwellings or more. If we go to them on every individual dwelling, every barn conversion, um, I understand there's an impact in terms of infrastructure, but they're going to be absolutely swamped. Um, so that was our intention. That's what we normally do with these consultees, go on the bigger schemes, so 10 dwellings or more. That's what I see. It's the difference between the big and the small. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. We, we've now had...